Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and before we get started on tonight's story, I'm going to let you know about Chilling, the sponsor of tonight's video, and quite honestly, uh, quite a few videos. So new announcements, and a wonderful, wonderful news, is that Chilling 2.0 is currently out, which is tons of new features with a fresh new look, and most importantly, I think this is like the best thing for all of you guys, Chilling is now free. You can still get a subscription if you'd like to, but to actually see everything with ads, it's free now, you can all check out Chilling. There's new content including full-length novels, podcasts, and more, and there's new features including creator profiles, the ability to follow just your favorite narrators, so, you know, you can follow me on Chilling, as well as your favorite authors, and to be notified when they post new content and community discussions, and honestly, a lot, lot more than that. There's new video content that's going to be showing up soon, and you can start listening right now for free. I cannot stress that enough. It's free, boys. Check it out. Chilling's available right now on Android and iPhone. You can find a link for it in the description down below. And now, on to tonight's story. Going out for a late night drive, I find myself at a red light. The weather was nice, I didn't have anywhere to be, so a nice little cruise to clear my head seemed like the right thing to do. I've had a lot on my mind lately. A nighttime cruise sounded mentally satisfying. After all, I've been doing so good, no reason not to. Ahead, the traffic lantern sways in the breeze, the red glow beaming through its weathered lenses. There's no one else at the intersection, and the empty streets start to make me feel antsy. My palms start to sweat, and I readjust my grip on the wheel as I look around. To my left, there's a gas station. An old mom-and-pop-looking place, with a single duo of pumps, standing under a flickering light. When I look through the window, there doesn't seem to be anyone working behind the counter. Maybe they're taking out the trash? To my right, there seems to be a bar that closed up for the night. The parking lot's empty, their neon sign shut off. I try to make out the name, but it's too dark. The sixth something. Maybe I'd have to come back some other time in the daylight and check it out. The light ahead remains red. No matter. I'm not in a hurry. I crack my knuckles nervously and turn on the radio. Some soothing music will do the trick. I tune the dial to find a station, watching the needle move on the dash as I navigate the static. The walls are meat. The needle wobbles back and forth, but nothing can really come through. Must be too far from the local stations. Something about the aggravated static makes me uneasy, and I feel myself starting to sweat. Gotta look at the red light again. Get distracted. Across the street, there's a fox walking in the grass. One that's pulling a tiny leash behind it. It stops, then looks at me momentarily, tilting its head in interest. Something about it makes me uncomfortable. I feel the condensation of sweat on my brow. I rub my eyes, feeling the glimmer of a migraine behind it. It passes. When I look down, I see a relief to the unending static on the radio. Sitting in the cup holder is a cassette tape. Seems too good to be true. I grab the tape and look at it. It's an old tape, one that looks like it's seen much use. Celine Dion's Falling Into You album. Perfect. I look around the intersection and see it's still empty. I have time to put it in. At last, some kind of reassurance for this damn red light. I check both ways again and lean over to put the tape in. The rectangular plastic of the cassette is satisfying. The crisp drag of it entering the deck is satisfying. I'm satisfied. As the tape plays over the speakers, I feel myself relax. I've been doing so good. It's better now. I'm better now. I sink into my seat as the piano intro starts, and I feel like I can breathe again. The music calms the buzzing in my head, and my nerves start to calm. Now if only the light would change and I could get on with my peaceful drive. 
Across the street, the fox continues to look at me. I pay it no mind. I place my hands back on the steering wheel. It's nice out tonight. Through the haze of the windshield, I look up at the red light. I don't know why it refuses to change, but I'm patient. It'll get there. It's fine. Everything's fine. I glance at all lanes of the intersection, thinking maybe a car is going to come. I didn't see it. That's why it's taking so long. The streets are empty. The streets are empty. The streets are empty. I look nervously at the gas station on my left, expecting it to be empty, and it's not. Something is standing behind the register. It looks like a man in a metal suit, like knight's armor, horribly modified with a tail made of wires and computer parts. No, I whisper to myself, looking away. I've been doing so good, there's no way it's gotten away from me. It's not really there. I know it's not, so I look to the right and make sure. The parking lot of the closed bar is no longer empty. Something stands tall amongst the rows of painted lines. A large horse in a suit. Human hands stapled where the front hooves should be. No, I say again. Feeling a rush of bile in my throat, I swallow and keep it down along with the murmur of the migraine that begins to return. I've been doing good. Really. It's fine. Everything's fine. It's been fine for a while. Really. The familiar cold sweat returns, hands clammy on the wheel. The song rises over the speakers of the playing tape, and I plead for it to comfort me as I look desperately at the red light. Why won't it change? Why won't it just change? I don't want to do this. I can't do this. Above, the red light mocks me. Across the street, the fox mocks me. It looks at me in judgment, its face twisting as it looks like it's trying to gag. Something behind it stirs in the trees and I can faintly make out the outline of a large rack of antlers and a writhing mass of slick tentacles. Please, please, please! I beat my hands on the steering wheel, feeling myself crumble under the weight of it all. Above, the light is red. Behind me, I see the headlights of another car. I watch them in the rearview mirror, and I feel the welling of tears in my eyes. The hair on my neck stands straight. My armpits are moist. A stream of sweat drizzles down my temple. I want to feel for my phone, but I don't think I have it. I don't think I've had it for a while. Behind me, the car slows for the red light and pulls in the lane next to me. The car stops. The groan of another engine idling, threatening my music. I don't want to look at them. So I don't. I don't care who it is. I try to focus on the music. But it's hard to hear it. I decide I'm going to run the red light. I mash the pedal to the floor, but the car doesn't move. I try again and again, each time harder than the last. I look at the fuel gauge and see I have no gas. Every light on the dash is on now. The collective of symbols telling me I'm not going anywhere soon. Deep breaths. You can do this. Deep breaths. Breathe. You've been doing good. You've been... Across the street, the fox is vomiting what looks like a man. Tearing fur makes way for a head and naked body. 
a slimy face with eyes that open in time to look at me. Please, I say again, looking away from the oral berth to the car next to me. The window rolls down, revealing two men in suits and close-cropped hair. They watch me wordlessly, eyes shielded behind sunglasses and a film of cigarette smoke that billows out. They say nothing. Only watch, that the sound of my music fades away to nothing. No, 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 no. I try to turn the volume down, but the radio explodes with noise. The sounds of a hundred screams fill my ears so loud it hurts. I scream against the noise, but it doesn't stop. I hit the stop button, try to eject the tape, anything. The screams become too much and I find myself tearing off my seatbelt, fleeing the car. Outside of the car, it's silent again. The fog is rolling in, one that wafts over the intersection until it's consumed by it. I look to the gas station for help, only to see the inside of it painted red. Inside the station, a man in a hard hat is getting mutilated, watching me with a smile as a metal alligator human tears through his guts with gloves made of knives. The alloy abomination snarls and stomps the man on the ground, crushing both his skull and the hard hat with a large steel boot. Outside, a garbage truck rumbles to life at the gas pump. Please... Over the crisp night air, I hear the neigh of the horseman. He's closer now, standing on the side of the road. He downs what looks like a glass of whiskey before squeezing it in his hand so hard it shatters. His unnatural hand runs the thumb over its fingers, shards of glass serrating the pale digits. Across the street, the fox completes its purge. The naked man rises from the fetal position in the grass, standing tall and awkward with a face and eyes that look like mine. Behind him, the deer monstrosity emerges from the woods, a portrait of animal gore of all kinds shifting under a hundred reaching feelers. I turn to get away, to get back into the car, but when I turn around, my car is gone. The men in sunglasses watch without emotion, their eyes bleeding from behind the sunglasses. After staring at me for a long moment, they turn their heads in unison to face the intersection. The trunk of their car pops, and a clown climbs out with a wooden bat in his hands. He points past me with the club, in the same direction the men in sunglasses are looking. Please help me. My voice chokes when I follow their gaze. And I want to cover my eyes as the fog retreats in fast forward. In the intersection, there's no red light. The pavement has crumbled in on itself, forming a crater where the street used to be. I don't want to see it, but I have to. I can't look away. My feet move on their own, and I ignore the abominations as I focus on the gaping hole. It calls me, and I can't seemed to resist its voice. I look down in the pit, wishing I could stop, even as I lower myself to climb in. There's something down there, and I need to see it. I make my descent, hands and shoes navigating the jagged concrete and twisted rebar as I blink away tears. As I near the bottom, the things from above gather around, each silently observing as I go deeper and deeper. I don't want to go, but I don't know how to stop. I scream at them for help and they ignore me. I curse at them angrily, shouting and pleading until I feel the purchase of flat ground beneath my feet. My breath shudders as I turn, but my body continues on autopilot to the center. Laying on the ground is a Hawaiian shirt. The fabric is frayed and dirty, 
the floral pattern torn in multiple places. I reach down to grab it, but it ignites into a ball of fire, stitches withering and turning black against the flame. Through the smoke of the smoldering shirt, a door materializes in the wall of the rock. I don't understand. I don't want to. I want to cry, but the tears won't come. I look above for guidance and see the rim of the pit is outlined with a silent audience. The naked man that looks like me, the standing horse in a suit with stapled on hands, the men in sunglasses bleeding from their eyes, the horror with the head of a deer, the metal alligator monster. In unison, they point to the door. I don't want to go. But I know I must. I need to see what they wanted to show me. Reluctantly, I head to the door. I hear the screams trying to get out, a chorus of pain and death and fear and welcoming and warning. I feel an angry heat the closer I get, and the knob is hot to the touch. When I open the door, it feels like my skull is breaking in two. I step in and the door slams behind me, a momentary darkness transitioning to a single flickering light. Behind the door, the walls are neat, gestating aggravated flesh. They squirm and wiggle, arms reaching and eyes staring as I break before them. I shiver and hug myself as it all comes back to me like a bomb detonating in the calm ocean that was my brain. I want to say I've been doing good, but I know it's a lie. I recognize the laundromat, even in its appalling state. Washing machines thrash on either side, the clanging of metal boxes squelching in the gore that's replaced the tiled floor. In the center of the room stands an old television on a cart, overgrown by tendons and sprouting teeth. Around me everything screams. I look behind the glass of every agitating machine, and all I see is a mass of pounding limbs fighting to get out. Fingers and toes, kicking and screaming, digits breaking against the glass. I want to be far away from here, back in the car on the open road. Behind me, the door is gone, replaced by a stretch of skin and veins. The light goes out, and all I can hear is the convulsing of the meat and the banging of the broken machines. In the darkness, the walls come for me, and I can only cower and sob as they draw near. In the dark, the television blinks to life. Even as I watch the walls close in and the writhing corridor narrow around me, the picture is old and grainy, but I recognize the scene. Like it's a movie I saw long ago. A man in a straitjacket kicking against men in white coats. The man thrashes inconsolably even as they stick a needle in his arm. His eyes are bloodshot and dart around. His hair is tossed and missing in places. There are undeniable, sickening familiarity to him. He shouts the same things over and over. And it all comes back to me as I make out the words. I mouth the words myself, the syllables feeling natural, even as I sob. I seem to have misplaced my pills. Somebody help me. Help me. Please. The idea, as she explained it to me, was simple enough. I would sit with her, I would talk with her, and share those few 
final moments of her life. She had no family left. She outlived them all. The same, sadly, was said for her friends and anyone else that she would have otherwise called on for that task. I remember she told me the worst part of a long life was the gradual removal of all things that make life worth living. I was offered this unusual position while supplying for a job only tangentially related to the kind of in-house care someone would provide to such an infirmed person. I suppose I had a look of youthful desperation about me, because one of the nurses at the facility, a tired-eyed woman not far from my age, asked if I'd like to make some money in the interim of my application's review. Naturally, I accepted, and was told about a kind-hearted 93-year-old widow nearing the end of her life. During our first phone call, the old woman had asked me to bring a few things, a tea kettle, a blanket, and a book of my choosing. On the morning of that fateful day, while finalizing our plans, she asked if I would read to her, and I happily agreed. I assumed the blanket and tea kettle were merely items of comfort, you know, two things that would be in their own way providing warmth to her, since she had spoken many times about how she'd recently been so cold. On the phone, we had never discussed payment. It had been offered, of course, and was, initially, the reason I accepted the somewhat morbid task. $1,500 to sit with an old woman during her final moments of life. A span of time that she assured me would last no longer than a few hours. She mentioned that her physician would, of course, remain in the house, stationed in another room, and ready to confirm uh, when it happened. Due to her condition, uh, the details of which I had never explicitly told, I was not allowed to visit with her prior to the curiously foreknown date of her death. As previously stated, we did, however, speak on the phone several times, and I learned a few things about her, the most notable being that she hadn't any surviving family members or friends, that she was truly alone in the world. She had explained briefly and vaguely her religious beliefs, which, as far as I could tell, belonged to no regular organized religion, but was a set of spiritual principles and mythic ideas to which she had closely adhered and devoutly followed since childhood. These beliefs, from what I gathered, were based upon some sort of obscure cosmic mysticism that she claimed was older than even the Abrahamic religions. She never lingered long on the topic, so there's not much else I could say about it. Over the phone, she was kind friendly, and surprisingly lively, at least vocally. For someone so close to the end, I actually found myself enjoying our conversations and quickly forgot about my original financial motivation. I wanted to meet this woman. I wanted to spend time talking to and laughing with her. When the day arrived, I drove to her house and parked in the driveway beside a car that looked like it hadn't moved in months. The sight saddened me. The idea that the woman was so mortally ill that driving herself around had been an impossibility for apparently quite some time. I'd never really experienced death before, you know, never closely. And here I was, about to witness it firsthand with a complete stranger. I walked up the front lawn's path to the door, knocked, and a voice issued from a speaker mounted beneath the doorbell, inviting me in. I entered noticed a row of shoes on a rack besides the door, and removed mine. I placed them on the second of three racks. The first was completely full, with shoes of varying sizes. Another speaker, mounted beside a mirror in the foyer, directed me rightward into a living room. In there I found the person with whom I was to spend the next hour or two. The room was wildly, densely decorated and furnished. There were pop culture memorabilia that dated back decades, and even to my historically untrained eye, seemingly centuries. Sculptures, busts, stuffed figures, plates, framed pictures, and many other honorary and commemorative objects of yesteryear sat on shelves, were mounted to walls, or piled into the surface of tables and chairs. It was as if within the room the entire recorded history of mankind had compiled itself into both mass-produced objects of entertainment and prized, untouched possessions of collectors. And sitting amidst it all, in a chair that had been outfitted with health-monitoring machinery, was an old woman. 
the woman I was to sit with in her final moments. I introduced myself softly, but her response was loud, surprisingly bolsterous, considering her condition. On the phone, she'd been lively, but in person her mannerisms and volume of speech truly belied her age and physical state. She welcomed me into the living room and invited me to sit in a chair across from her. I removed the dolls that had been seated there and placed them with others on a nearby table, then unpacked the items I brought, the tea kettle and the book, wrapped in a thick, hand-sewn blanket, a gift from my late grandmother. I offered to drape the blanket over the woman's gown, which she agreed to, and then asked where the kitchen was, expecting her to want tea as soon as possible. But to my surprise, she told me to set the kettle aside for the moment, and asked that I do the same for the book. She wanted to talk first. She wanted to continue the last conversation we had over the phone. We chatted for about 30 minutes, and although our meeting had been planned around her expected expiration, I still had yet to ask exactly how she had arrived at the time. She had no attempt to hasten things along. Our, our chat drifted to related topics and circled back over after exhausting all conversational avenues. She was youthful in spirit, characteristically exuberant, even though her body had reached its biological limits. When thirty minutes had gone by, I asked somewhat anxiously if she'd like me to put the kettle on and begin reading. She agreed to the tea, but said that she'd prefer to keep story time saved for later. I went to the kitchen and started the kettle, fished out two packets of hibiscus tea that she'd had in the cupboard, and set them beside two cups that had already been set out, presumably by her yet-to-be-seen aid. The kitchen wasn't nearly as decorated as the living room, but the same motif of memorabilia was still present. Coffee cups bore images of old-timey celebrities, while framed recipes showed classic cartoon characters, those in chef hats and aprons, holding various cooking utensils. It was cute, charming, a glimpse into the past well before my time. When the tea was ready, I brought it into the living room on a steel tray and set it on the table that was roughly between us, then delicately handed her a cup and a little glass plate. She thanked me, sipped from the cup, and asked me a fairly unusual question. What do you remember most fondly from your childhood? It took a moment for me to think of something, but I finally recalled how when I was seven, my dad had taken my brother and I on a camping trip how much fun it had been to have nature all to ourselves. We'd spent the weekend fishing, exploring, watching animals, an experience that was for us closely sheltered suburban kids, you know, new, scary, mystifying at first. As I told the woman about the weekend, her face began to take on an even greater degree of excitement, as if she were drinking from the memories and regaining some semblance of her youth before my eyes. When I reached the story's conclusion, she clapped her hands, accidentally spilling the tea onto her lap. She yelped almost childishly and thanked me for having brought the quilt, otherwise the hot tea would have assuredly scarred her thighs. I scrambled up and asked her if there was any towels nearby, and still laughing, she pointed towards a closet at the end of the room, barely visible behind an antique armoire. I carefully slid the armoire aside, retrieved a few towels from a large stack therein, and would have gone back to the old woman if if I hadn't seen something odd in the next room. When entering from the foyer, the living room had two exits. To the left is the kitchen, to the right, beside the aforementioned closet, is a threshold to another room. I hadn't noticed it before, just as I hadn't noticed the closet. But once beside it, I saw its door was slightly ajar, and through the slim open space, I saw someone sitting in a chair, facing away from the entryway. With my focus on my task being overruled by my curiosity, I entered the room. Unlike the room before it, this room was scarcely furnished. A bed, night table, box fan were the only objects in the room, aside from the person sitting in the foldable steel chair near a heavily curtained window. Despite the eclectic yet cozy decor throughout the rest of the house, I felt a strange, inexpressible atmosphere of hostility when entering this room. I sensed in a way that I can't describe that I... 
I wasn't welcome within the impersonal, Spartan space, but still, I continued on, drawing towards that unmovable figure in the chair by a weird magnetism, a volition that I wasn't sure was even my own. Still holding on to the towels, I walked around the chair, not wanting to startle the person by speaking or placing my hand on their shoulder. The chair was directly in the scope of the window, and yet the thick curtains allowed only the faintest of rays to filter through. There was no lights, and the space outside of that illuminated square was draped in a gloom that seemed unnatural, ominously manufactured. When I rounded the chair and came face to face with the person sitting therein, I dropped the towels and nearly fell to the floor from the shock of what I saw. The person sitting in the chair wore scrubs, and I'm sure that these had fit snugly at some point in their life, but the fabric that draped from the shriveled body seemed several sizes too large. Both portions of the outfit were also darkly stained in various places and bore signs of savage violence. The fabric over the stomach had been torn and the flesh beneath was shredded. The brown, decayed skin hanging in loose tatters. The most appalling aspect was the face, or the lack thereof. The hair had fallen out, or had been ripped out, leaving the scalp bald, and between the forehead and the neck... There existed only a gaping hole, a horrible, gruesome cavity, bereft of even the remnants of a skull. The head was held upright by some post-death seizing of the body, a faceless, statuesque lifelessness that would inspire nightmares after nightmares in the days after. I honestly doubt I screamed. In that dreadful moment, I could barely breathe, and yet the old woman came ambling into the room, claiming that she'd heard me cry out. Her eyes only briefly glanced at the corpse of the chair before noticing the towels I'd dropped. Ah, you found them. Great. If you wouldn't mind, I'd love to dab the blanket. Wouldn't want the tea soaking through to my legs and bringing me a chill later. Her utter lack of regard for my shock state in the corpse, which I only then noticed radiated a carnal stench more awful than anything I'd ever smelled, told me that she had known about it the entire time. Weakly, my nerves barely operated in my fright. I pointed to the corpse, and the woman looked at it again. Only this time, she clapped her hands and shouted, Oh! as if noticing a pet that she had yet to introduce to me. So you've met Elizabeth. She is, well, was, my caretaker. A sweet girl, single mother of uh, two boys, who I've been told are the best. She's been with me for, let's see, four months now. And before her was Yolanda. And before that was a young man. Uh, you would have loved him. Marcus, I think his name was. Yeah, he was a nice boy. They were all so nice. So helpful, just like you've been. The woman's demeanor hadn't changed. She spoke as if she was recalling old friends. And yet, on an instinctual level, I immediately understood that I was in grave danger. The blanket was still wrapped around her, trailing damply on the floor. I hadn't noticed before, I hadn't gotten a sense of her stature when she'd been seated, but in that room, with her standing only a few feet away, I realized for the first time how tall she was. She towered over me, standing at a height that was undoubtedly at least six foot five, and adding to the strangeness of her erected form was that her legs, from what I could tell through the cover of the blanket, were incredibly long disproportionately so in relation to her torso. Now why don't I grab these towels from you, and we can head back to the other room and finish our tea. I think I'm ready for that story now. I stood there, frozen by fear and uncertainty, as the woman calmly approached me, but instead of bending over and reaching down for the towels, something she'd logically have to do given her pretty natural height, she instead lifted the blanket and the gown beneath and outstretched something that was not a leg, but an appendage that resembled a thickly corded drawstring. But this limb was made of lustrous black flesh rather than a tightly woven thread, 
and it moved with an unsettling dexterity. At the end of the monstrous limb were several fat digits that writhed in an undulant, repulsive manner. And with these, she grasped the towel and raised them up to her torso, where she received them with her human arms. The horrible limb was then retracted back beneath the gown, and before she let the fabric fall, I saw others. A veritable trunk of tautly wound black cords with which the freed limb re-entwined itself in a manner that was efficient as it was sickening. She then lowered the gown, threw the blanket over the chair-seated corpse, and dabbed the damp spot with the towels. Once satisfied, she wrapped the blanket around herself and returned to the living room, beckoning me to follow as if nothing out of the ordinary had happened. Dumbstruck, horrified, I... I followed against my will. I was led into the room as if under some spell. I returned to my seat across from her and, with the mindless mechanical motions of one whose willpower had been entirely depleted and supplanted by another's, I read from the book that I brought. It was a collection of short stories by Arthur Macon. She'd mentioned on the phone that she'd enjoyed stories about weird, mythical things. And after finishing three stories, she again clapped her hands, signifying that I should stop. I closed the book and I laid it on my lap, whilst my brain struggled to come to terms with the unprecedentedly bizarre circumstances. The woman applauded my narration, even though I couldn't remember adding any sort of vocal flavor to the reading. It had been fairly straightforward, done almost absent-mindedly. I thanked her for the compliments and tried to blink away the tears that uncontrollably swelled beneath my eyes. Now I think we arrived at the time. I can't thank you enough for this wonderful afternoon. I'm so thankfully grateful for your company. A woeful old woman like myself couldn't have asked for a better companion to sit vigil with her. Thank you, child. I have initially planned on incorporating you into the family, but now I just can't bring myself to do that truly been the best of all those who've sat with me during my ends. The plural of that final word and the dreadful, vague connotation of it broke me completely. The tears fell and I sunk inward, entirely consumed by terror. The woman, misinterpreting my fear of her for sadness at her imminent passing, urged me not to cry saying that death comes to everyone eventually. Her demeanor then became suddenly and strikingly somber, and she asked if I'd kindly leave her to be alone. Needing no further motivation, I arose from my seat, leaving behind everything I'd brought, and sprinted out of the living room. But before I could reach the front door and return to the normal, sunlit world, she called out, Oh, your payment is on the Davenport, the sofa in the white envelope. After a brief war of wills, the broke and hungry student versus the terrified human, I, I begrudgingly returned to the room and careful, keep my eyes focused on the sofa that sat just beside the room's entryway. And while I never looked directly at the woman, I glimpsed and heard her awful transformation into something else. Perceived audibly and peripherally the death of her human shell. I escaped the house without having witnessed the full exposure of that abominable thing that had clothed itself in human skin for who knows how long, and had hidden itself amongst mankind through cycles of life that assuredly dated back further than the house's memorabilia would have had you believe. As I stumbled down the driveway, I happened to glance inside the car parked there and was given one final parting moment of horror. The car hadn't belonged to the old woman. Its owner, I think, was Elizabeth. In the back seat, I saw two children's backpacks, but no sign of the children themselves. In about two hours, I made fifteen hundred dollars, and yet I'd give it all back to erase my memories of that twisted afternoon. I can only hope that the police, who I called shortly after departing, could bring some kind of closure to the families of the victims. Justice to the murderer whose... death, I doubt, had any permanent 
meaning. The doctor, one of the new plastic surgeons at Kashmir Hospital, looked a little sheepish as he approached my desk. I had only seen him a few times, and he had never spoken to me directly. He was a vain fellow in the same way a few of the other hotshot docs around the ER, but today he looked rattled. His hair was unkempt, his clothing looked dirty, and he was glancing around in that way that made me think he might be followed. Are you the one who collects the stories? He asked. I looked around, not sure if he was hiding from someone, before telling him that I was. Carl said you'd understand. I don't know what happened to me, but he told me that you might be able to help me make sense of it. I know you're at work, but do you have a minute to talk? It was currently around 10 o'clock, and I was in the middle of a lull in activity. The real work wouldn't be possible until after they called my visitors to leave, so I pushed out a chair and pulled out a notepad. I had started carrying it religiously, stories becoming habitual, and I wanted to get all the information while it was fresh. His name was Dr. Gary Long, and he had experienced something I had only heard about once before. The more he talked, the more I realized he was talking about the creatures that had taken up residence in the Forbidden Corridor over in the East Wing record mezzanine. I've only been working at Kashmir Hospital for a couple of months, but I heard all the rumors, right? Dr. Logan still tells people about what happened to him in the elevator. People talk about the, the ghost girl in the South Wing, the one that jumps from the fifth story balcony, and everyone, nurses and doctors alike, know that if you stay in the OR too late, you might just run into shaky leg Mary, right? I listened, but I privately thought that they were, they were nothing but stories. It was, it, it was just talk. Every hospital has them, but Kashmir Hospital it has a bit of a reputation. Even in med school, the students know about the weirdness that surrounds the hospital. And when my friends heard that I had accepted an offer to work here, they joked that I was going to get taken away by some ghost one night. I don't think it was a ghost that tried to get me. Ghosts don't do what this thing did. It was late when I got done with my case. I had dressed out and was leaving to get to my car from the garage. Now this may sound silly, but I already parked my car at the bottom of the car park. It's a 2022 Mercedes. One that I'm still likely to be paying off when I'm 40, but doctors are expected to maintain a certain air of affluence. Fancy watches, big houses, shiny cars. It all gives off the illusion of wealth, while most of us are just drowning in student debts credit card debts. The car was a frivolity that I couldn't really afford, but I was trying and mostly succeeding at keeping my head above water. So when I took the elevator down to the fifth floor basement of the car park, I found nothing but empty spots. I, mean, I was shocked. I had parked in the third spot on the left and now it was gone. There was no other cars down here either, so I could only assume that someone had either stolen it or it had been towed for some other reasons. I was grumbling when I climbed back into the elevator, but I felt confident that this could be solved in short order. If it had been stolen, then my insurance would give me a rental car until the police found it. The car was insured, insured for quite a lot, actually, and I had little doubt that the premiums would buy me another one if, if it had been taken. If the hospital had my car towed, well, they'd get me a rental car or the impound lot to bring my damn car back. When the elevator didn't move after I jabbed the button, my anger flared. I slapped at the buttons, but nothing happened. So I picked up the phone, I tried to call the switchboard, but there was no tone. The doors didn't close either, which... I mean, it didn't seem weird until I thought about it. They just stayed open. And I finally threw the phone at the bank of lift buttons and decided to walk out into the garage. To try to find someone to yell at. It had been a long day, I was tired. All this bull crap was really starting to make me mad. I started walking towards the ramp then, and if I'd known what would happen later, I think, I think I would have just stayed in the elevator. The next floor up was empty too, and I wondered how later it was before my watch told me that it was barely nine. Most of the other employees were probably just lazy, didn't want to drive all the way back up. They didn't care if people dinged their cars, and I, I figured I'd see more cars as I went up. 
I was comfortable enough down there. I mean, concrete box creating a cave of sorts, and the fluorescence overhead hummed with insectile good cheer. Other than the hum, my footfalls seemed to be the only noise. The constant talk, talk, talk of my sneakers was monotonous. It was also a little nice to know that I hadn't just gone deaf. There really wasn't any other sounds down there. And as I came to the third floor, I was surprised that there still wasn't any windows to the outside. The first two levels I had come through were basements. But surely this one had to be on ground level, right? This floor was when I started to notice the plants as well. They were palmettos, I think. And they sprouted up from the concrete in places. The fronds looked pokey. I really didn't want to touch them and find out. I wondered why maintenance and groundskeeping hadn't done something about them, but... I mean, that's really none of my business. They were in the corners or out of the way, and they weren't hurting anyone. The Georgia flora had already been a bit invasive sometimes, and seeing plants in a man-made structure wasn't anything uncommon. That was the first time I felt something watching me, too. The first time I heard something other than the lights humming or the scuff of my shoes. I was coming up the ramp and onto the second floor, when I heard something scrub against the concrete. It was a low sound. Like fingernails. But when I turned, there was nothing there. The concrete parking structure was still empty. It was becoming odd that I hadn't seen any cars or people. A dozen others, nurses and techs, had been in the surgery with me. And to have seen absolutely none of their vehicles, it was strange. I was coming to the levels just beneath the entrance ramp. Why hadn't I seen anyone yet? As the phantom eyes bore a hole between my shoulder blades, I picked up the pace. I wanted to be out of there, and my anger was beginning to subside as the creeping chill of fear sent icy fingers through it. Hadn't seen anyone yet. As the phantom eyes bore a hole between my shoulder blades, I picked up the pace. I wanted to be out of here, and my anger was beginning to subside as the creeping chill of fear sent icy fingers through it. The next floor should have definitely been a ground level. But it was the same bland box that the others had been. No cars, no people, but the plants had gotten thicker. They were looking more like jungle plants now. And the cool cave was becoming a little humid. I saw vines hanging from the ceiling and they seemed to be coming right out of the concrete. Why hadn't I noticed any of this before? Its presence did little to soothe me. and when I, when I heard a crunch from behind me, I quickened my pace again. I could still hear that low noise behind me. I wasn't as alone as I thought it, it. It felt like something was stalking me. And as I ran up the ramp, I almost cried out when it was more of the same. The plants were getting thicker, and the concrete seemed to be giving way to dirt in places. I was running now, my feet carrying me onward as my brain began to scream at me that we're trapped. I stumbled, but I caught myself before I fell, and I glanced back to make sure nothing was chasing me. I don't know how, but I knew that if I fell, that would be the end of me. I'd gone higher than the parking deck could possibly be, five floors higher than the roof when the lights suddenly went out. I don't mean the lights flickered, I don't, I don't mean they sort of dimmed, I mean that suddenly I was something akin to blind. As I stood still in the blackness, I could hear them again. They, they sounded like animals, walking around on all fours as their claws scraped against the ground. I, I thought there was only one, but the longer I listened, the more I thought that I might have... Might have heard two or three, or maybe as many as six. They were searching for me. They were stalking me through the murk. I didn't dare move. Something in the instinctual part of my brain told me that if I, if I moved, they'd know where I was. It told me to stand as still as I could and not to make a sound as they hunted for me. They searched, they sniffed, but eventually I heard them moving away and, and that was when I made my escape. I ran like my life depended on it. I mean, maybe it did. They heard me sooner than I would have thought, and I tore off in the general direction of the next ramp. The layout of the parking structure was pretty uniform. I, I knew that if I kept moving in a circle, I could get to the next floor. Something in me screamed that if I could get out of here, that if I, if I could get free of whatever loop I was in, I would lose those creatures and be done with this madness. Their claws sounded huge as they ate up the ground. They made little huffing noises as they ran, and I... I couldn't imagine what they must look like. The guy settled on a pack of panthers that had come to get me. 
when I suddenly ran into a concrete wall. I just knew that they were about to rip me to shreds. It turned out to be for the best, however. As I lay there trying to see if my nose was broken, something hit the wall I had run into with a loud and angry yowl. It hit it hard enough to send the concrete chips cascading over me, and I put my hand over my mouth as I lay completely silent on the dusty concrete. It picked itself up and shook off whatever damage that the wall had done to it before snuffling the air. It was looking for me. I didn't want to be found. I could feel its bulk as it came close. Smell the rancid meat that must lay beneath those claws. And I hoped that it couldn't hear me trembling. I expected that every breath would be my last. And uh, the thought that I would die as I took shallow half-breaths was depressing. Some interminable amount of time later, the creature moved away. And I got up as quietly as I could. And I tiptoed for the wall. I had misjudged the circle I was making. and When I found the edge, I headed up the ramp and kept climbing. Something was different now. I could, I could feel it. Even when my light-deprived eyes began to adjust to the intrusion of light, I knew I was getting close to the surface. As my hope came back, I started running again, and that's when I heard them behind me. I came up and I saw the crossbar and little booth that told me that the front of the parking deck was in sight. I put on a burst of speed, and when I ducked under the arm, I heard some claws raking against the wood. I fell onto the asphalt and looked back in time to see a solid black creature with a head like a spade. Its body, it looked like it was covered in scales instead of fur, and teeth that hung from its mouth looked painfully large. It had no eyes, but it pointed its spade-shaped head in my direction and seemed to know where I was. Despite the small burn of the moon and the distant islands of the security lights, the creature was still unwilling to come out and get me. It slunk back into the parking garage. And I sighed in relief. I screamed in surprise when I heard footsteps coming towards me, but, but it was just Carl. He'd been spoken by the parking deck, and when he heard me running out, he came to investigate. I told him about the creature. He only shrugged, like, there's one more thing on his plate. He offered to go get my car for me. When I asked him if he wasn't afraid of the things down there, he said it was nothing new. He, he said, stuff like this happens all the time. He told me to go wait for him in the front lobby. There's a guy who I think will want to talk to you. I have a feeling he knows just what you're talking about. The Mercedes in question came rolling around at that point, and the Dr. Long seemed relieved. I finished my notes, but I could feel him staring in much the same way that he had described the creature stared at him. So have you ever heard of anything like that before? Uh, yeah, no, it's not the first time. Um, if it happens again, just stay in the elevator till it stops. Hospital's like a strange kind of waiting room all its own, you know? Sometimes you slip into places that aren't prepared for you. It's best to just wait until the reality reasserts itself. I don't think I'll be parking in that structure anymore. I'll take my chances at the staff parking. A few dings on the door is a small price to pay for peace of mind. He thanked me before leaving, and I transcribed his notes into this PDF that I've been keeping on weird things that happen around here. Eventually, we all slip into the strange other room just beyond the waiting room. And if you're lucky, you get to slip back out again, too. Dr. Long was lucky, but he may not get so lucky a second time. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and before we get started on tonight's story, John Beardify is tonight's author, and his book is currently available on Amazon, Tales of Winter Horror Stories from December 2022 to February 2023. Beardify has some amazing stories, you guys find him here a lot, as well as many other Creepypasta narrations channels. 
If you like what you hear or you like what you see, then I strongly encourage you to check out his book. There's a link in the description down below. And now, on to tonight's story. My friends weren't exactly enthusiastic about uh, meeting me at a place called the Death Ridge Lodge. I mean, even after I told them that Death Ridge was just the name of the shepherd who used to own the land. The truth was, I was more than a little nervous myself. I'd been out of the country for five years. There there had been calls and letters, but my friends and I hadn't seen each other in all that time. Would we still have the connection that we once did? Some of the changes the time had wrought were surprising. Others less so. We'd all expected my stubborn, brilliant friend Jennifer to be an attorney like her father, but in a story straight out of a cheesy Hallmark movie, she'd married a guy from a tiny town in Kentucky. She had two kids. Meanwhile, Ned, a loud-mouthed, extroverted redhead, had somehow ended up working for a lonely home office as a computer programmer. And then there was Zoe. She'd been my crush since our sophomore year of college. It wasn't just her auburn hair or piercing green eyes, it was the care and honesty that she showed in everything she did. Before her, I'd never met someone who really listened, who really cared about other people, you know, without working their own angle. We'd all expected great things from her, but... Well, in the end, she'd wound up like me, back in our hometown, unsure about the future. But now that so much time had passed, would we even have anything in common anymore? As it turned out, I needn't have worried. Not even the wailing winter storm and unexpected power outages could dampen our good time. Ned, Zoe, Jennifer, and I gathered around a roaring flagstone fireplace, sharing our favorite scary stories and urban legends. It didn't matter that the howling wind made going outside deadly, or that snow had cut off the forest road to the outside world. We had warmth, food, booze, and our rediscovered friendship. We also had Lee. When we arrived, Lee explained to us that he was the off-season caretaker of Death Rich Lodge, and for the surrounding cabins. During tourist season in the summer, the place was swarmed with hospitality workers, but from fall to spring, Lee mostly had the place to himself. When the blizzard hit, he made a point of checking in on us. Temperature's going down out there, he warned us that fateful night. Visibility's almost zero. You kids, you wouldn't want to get lost out there tonight, or any other night. Don't worry, so he smiled. You have no intention of going outside in that, she pointed out to the wind-driven snow that was rattling against the window panes. It can't be that easy to get lost, though, can it? Ned, always the contrarian, asked. I mean, we're on the side of a mountain. To go one way, you just go down. Go the other way, you just go back up, right? Not that simple, Lee grunted, pulling up a stool. A hundred miles from civilization out here, and if you can't recognize any landmarks, all them pine trees out there look the same. Even if you think you know where you're going, this mountain likes to play tricks. The gentle slope you walk down and fall might be dangerously steep in spring. Boulders tumble. Streams change course. Paths disappear from one season to the next. There's dozens of trails crisscross in this old mountain. 1800s logging road, game trails, other paths so old it's impossible to tell who made them. And trust me, you lose your way out there, all you're going to do is get more and more lost. Then you'll start panicking. At that point, if hypothermia and hunger and the bears don't get you, old man Deathrich, his dogs certainly will. Deathrich? Dogs? Zoe and Jennifer asked at once. Just how much do you four know about Deathrich Lodge? Not much, I admitted. I was looking for a place where my old friends and I could meet over the holidays. I mean, this place looked cozy. We had hiking and skiing and good reviews. And besides, back then, the weather forecast said we'd have a clear weekend. Lee nodded, as if that was about what he expected. It's an odd place, an odd history. Just after the Revolutionary War, a man named Jebediah Deathrich showed up here. Started construction on a cabin. He said the mountain had called to him. He'd seen it in a dream. That Patrick Henry had gifted him the entire mountainside in exchange for services rendered during the war. Now, there was plenty of land back then, and Grant's being handed out like candy. No one called him on it. Besides, 
Folks wanted farmland. The slope of a damn mountain? Y'all thought Jeb Detrich was crazy. He carved a life out in these hills, swearing that he and the land were one flesh. At Jeb, Jeb and his son, they felled forests, they dragged out the stumps, they planted orchards. They set up secret garden patches back in the woods. They raised chicken, cows, a flock of sheep. For a while, things were good. The old man stared into the fire. If you young people get bored with all this history, you know, just say so. Well, it's not like we got anything better to do, do we? Ned scoffed. No, please go on, it's interesting. Though reassured Lee, Ned rolled his eyes. Well, the years rolled by, and Jeb died, and he passed his land on to his son and grandson, who went on living the same way he had. Meanwhile, towns, towns are building up around the mountain. The more they expanded, the more folks demanded proof the mountain had really belonged to the Deathridges. Now, by the end of the Civil War, that's uh, to say Jeb's great grandson's time. Nobody cared about yellowed papers and ancient claims. Folks wanted the mountain developed. Well, they kept suing until they found a judge who agreed with them. Amos Detrich got a few acres. The rest went to mining and logging companies. But taking advantage of the Detrich's land was no easy task. You see, the Detrich, uh, they refused to accept the court's decision. They kept living in their hidden shacks on the mountainside. They made life live in hell for the companies who, from their point of view, were trespassing on their property. Every day there were downed trees on the road, supplies burnt, animals missing. And it went on for decades, all the way into the 1900s. While no one had been hurt in Amos Detrit's little guerrilla war, it was costing those companies more than the mountain was worth. They had to put a stop to it, so the first sign of trouble was when Alice Detrich, Amos' wife from back east, Stop coming into town to sell her honey and her fruit preserve. A few days later, Amos was found in the middle of a dirt logging road, surrounded by his three mastiffs. They had all been shot to pieces. And ten years later, some trappers found Alice and the kids in a shallow grave. Said it looked like they died badly. So, who did it? Jennifer asked. Uh, nobody can prove nothing about nothing, but a group of flashy out-of-towners rode in on the last train from Chicago that night. They left in the morning. Folks in town said they saw lantern lights glowing up on a logging road and gunfire in the haulers. Lee stared thoughtfully into the fireplace. In a way, I, I guess you could say that the, the death riches, they won out in the end. The mountain never yielded enough timber to or any coal to justify the expense the companies that had fought so hard over the mountain, even killed to keep it, all went bankrupt a few years later. The place was practically abandoned until the National Parks craze took over in the 1950s. Some clever investor bought it off the bank for pennies, and they built the cabins and the lodge that we're sitting in today. But what does all that have to do with old man Detrich and his dogs? Well, the mountain wasn't completely left alone after all them companies closed down. So the local men came up here to hunt. Grandmothers collected fruit from the death-rich woodland orchards. And the teenagers, well, they came up here to do what teenagers do. And over the years, rumors began to trickle down about strange sightings in the woods. Some folks got to thinking maybe Amos Deathrich really wasn't dead. Or if he was, he was still around somehow. Do you mean, like a ghost? I ventured. Well, you can call it what you want. Lee prodded the dying embers. I'm just telling you how I heard it, and you wouldn't believe some of the tales the folks in town heard about this mountain. Like old Bruce Higgins, who came back from deer hunting and was all bitten and torn up with his rifle missing. He said that he'd been chased down the mountains by three snarling shepherd dogs, just like those huge mastiffs found shot death beside Amos. Miss Nellie Price said that she'd saw the old man himself stalking through the trees with a hundred-year-old hunting rifle and a sack of dead rabbits slung over his shoulder. Lee rambled on. Jennifer tried to hide a smile. I'm sorry, she chuckled. It's just 
My dad was a hunter, and he used to see things in the woods too, usually after his fifth beer. And my great aunt Mildred was convinced she was hearing whispers in her walls until my mother got rid of the bird's nest in her chimney. The bird song had been echoing, and the pipes sound like real human voices. My point is, there's a snowball effect with stories like these. They live rent-free in the back of people's minds, and when they see something they can't explain, you just keep adding to them. I'm not saying you're wrong, we grumbled. I've never seen old man Amos myself. I lived up here all my life, but I will say, there's something off about this mountain. Maybe it goes all the way back to Jeb Deathridge, or even before that. Otherwise, see how you can account for all these disappearances, like the four high schoolers who went camping up here on a dare back in the 1970s. Nothing was left of them. Nothing but a trampled down tent and the soggy ashes of their fire. Wasn't there an investigation? So asked. Oh, sure there was. The police concluded that the girls had run away from home. And then when Terry Bannister and his nine-year-old son didn't come back from their hiking trip, they blamed Wolf. And when a local artist's car was found at a logging road with spikes in the tires and the driver's side door hanging off its hinges, they called it an abandoned vehicle. They just towed it back into town and didn't look for her. I mean, don't you see where I'm going with all this? Even since the logging and the mining dried up, tourism's the only thing keeping these little towns afloat. The ghost of Amos Deathrich and his three hellhounds. That makes her a fine local legend. But if some crowd ever found out about the real horrible crimes that happen up here on this mountain every year, that'd be the death of the whole industry. I call bullshit, Ned laughed. But this sounds an awful lot like a scary story that like locals tell to scare us. You know, like the wide-eyed out-of-towners. <laughs> Am I right? Call it what you will. Lee shrugged again. I will not go outside till the storm passes, if I were you. He pulled on his boots and wrapped himself in his winter gear, so weathered and worn that it was all the same uniform tone of grayish brown. You kids got everything you need? He waved to us as he trudged out the door. Hey, uh, stay safe out there! I called out too late. The only response was the rattling of the screen door and the howling of the wind. If it was the wind. I thought of the savage jaws of enormous mastiffs. I shuddered. We all slept beside the fireplace that night. Everyone had their own excuse. Ned claimed the rooms were too cold. Zoe said she wanted to have a slumber party. Jennifer had already fallen asleep in her chair, but I knew our real reason for keeping close to each other was that Lee's tale had unnerved all of us more than we liked to admit. We craved the primal comforts of fire, warmth, and companionship before going to sleep. I dared to take a look out of the frozen window, but all I could see was blackness. Too cold for even a ghost, I told myself with a chuckle, before stirring the fire and curling up in one of the lodge's thick blankets. My dreams were haunted by worm-eaten faces and shallow graves, shadowy figures on desolate mountain paths. I woke before anyone else in the morning. I'd always loved the peace of being awake while others slept. I took my time making my coffee and examining what the storm had done to the mountainside. The trees were bent, the icy spikes stabbed into them, an almost gray sky. At least a foot of snow covered the lodge's patio. Frigid air blasted my face as I heaved open the sliding glass door and stepped out into the winter wonderland. And the beautiful as it was, something more than the cold was bothering me. It took me a moment to fully realize what it was. There was no footprints leading to the cabin where Lee was staying. True, maybe the snow had filled them in, but I mean, no smoke rose from the chimney either. Where had Lee gone? I was leaning out over the railing for a better view when I heard a low growl behind me. I wasn't alone on the patio. Half-frozen drool hung from the mastiff's gaping jaws. Its hazel eyes burned with fury. Another identical dog growled behind me. I'm trying to cut off my escape. I bolted for the door and slid it shut just before a mouth as large as my face smashed into the glass, cracking it. The enormous dog lunged again, widening the spiderweb pattern on the glass. Barks and howls chilled my blood. My friends were waking, but not fast enough. Just a few more minutes, Zoe mumbled while I shook her. Holy shit! Ned screamed, pointing at the mastiff, slamming itself into the glass. Get to the kitchen! 
Jennifer grabbed the fire poker and waved us through, slamming the kitchen's heavy wooden door. From outside, barks, snarls, shattering glass. Heavy canine steps across the hardwood. A low, mournful howl echoed through the cabin, and three sets of paws began scratching at the door. I wondered if the enormous dogs outside were calling to their master. Oh my god, oh my god, what the fuck is going on? Ned jabbed his finger at my chest like all this was my fault. Is this some kind of sick joke? Jennifer demanded. How should I know? I shouted back at Ned. I know what's going on, Zoe murmured. Amos Deathrich, we're on his mountain, and those are his dogs, just like Lee described them. Ghost dogs? Ned rolled his eyes. Come on! That mastiff out there just smashed his head against a sliding glass door until it broke. Would you call that normal dog behavior? Listen! Jennifer put her ear to the wooden door as it shook beneath the dog attacks. They're not just scratching the door, they're gnawing on it. Those aren't ordinary dogs, and speaking of Lee, where is he? I, I, I don't... No, I... I don't think he made it back last night. I thought of the smokeless chimney and the untrammeled snow. The kindly old caretaker was probably lying beneath it with his throat ripped out. Amos had come for him at last. The door rattled on its hinges. We gotta find a way out of here. The door's not gonna last much longer, Jennifer whispered, unlatching the small window above the sink. Oh, sure, great plan, Ned rolled his eyes. Let's run through the woods in sub-zero temperatures in our pajamas. What could possibly go wrong? What do you suggest, then? Jennifer challenged. As much as I hated to admit it, Ned was right. Last night's fire was dead, and its warmth was fading fast. If Amos and his dogs didn't kill us, the cold would. Zoe was already struggling to keep herself from trembling. While the rest of us argued, she had been scrounging for supplies. She found a few cobwebby soup cans, three dull kitchen knives, an almost empty box of matches, and a trap door. It took all of our strength to heave it open, and even then the light didn't reach whatever waited at the bottom. One thing, however, was clear. We were running out of time. The timbers on the kitchen door splintered, treating us to a view of slobbering fangs. The rusty window frame screeched as Jennifer flung it open. I looked down at her bare feet. Jen... Going out there is suicide. I will not wait to die in some dark fucking hole! We gotta make a run for it! Of course, I suddenly remembered. Jennifer had claustrophobia. That cellar must have looked like her worst nightmare. Look, I know you're scared. We all are, but... But nothing! I'm going! Jennifer wiped away her tears with her palm sleeves and leapt down into the snow. Behind us, the dogs had almost broken through. Ned, Zoe, and I sprinted for the trap door and slammed it shut behind us. The mastiffs sniffed around and dug at the floor over our heads, but only for a moment. A horrifically human whistle split the silent winter air outside, followed by a cruel command. Zigger, boys! First came barks, and then snarls, and then Jennifer began to scream. Maybe it was a blessing that we couldn't see what was happening out amongst the frozen trees, but just hearing it was bad enough. I pressed my fists against my ears and shut my eyes tight against the awful ripping and gnawing, barely audible over Jennifer's screams. When it was finally over, the chattering of our teeth felt like the only noise left in the world. I'd forgotten how much the cold could physically hurt. With trembling fingers, Zoe struck a match. We were in a low-ceiling dirt cellar. Decades of cobwebs hung like hideous curtains above us, and generations of junk had been scattered carelessly across the uneven ground. We rummaged through it by matchlight, looking for something, anything that we could use. Pay dirt, Ned shouted. He found a canvas sack full of moth-eaten wool blankets, leather boots, and parkas beneath a heap of snowshoes. We bundled up immediately, grateful for the warmth, but there was little else of value in the heap of rubbish around us. We were running out of matches. This is weird, Zoe nudged me. She'd found an old wooden chest full of century-old dresses, leather bags and belts and tiny silver lockets. The cellar ceiling groaned with heavy footsteps. Zoe instinctively pocketed the locket and grabbed my arm. Now where the rest of you run off to? The voice above us was the same one that had sicked the mastiffs on Jennifer. There was something antiquated, gravelly, and wild about it. 
something that made me think of the unsettling tale of the Death Rich clan. Amos. Zoe mouthed, pointing to the far side of the cellar. The crumbling stone wall faded into blackness, but as I crawled silently closer, I could see what lay above. A coal chute. An escape. The footsteps overhead left the kitchen. I imagine they were heading upstairs to check the bedrooms. We had shoes and a way of keeping warm, even if they were filthy and fit badly. If we were going to try to slip out through the coal chute, it was now or never. Ned's hand shot out and grabbed my wrist as I struggled to push open the rusted chute cover. You crazy? He hissed. Do you not hear what happened to Jen out there? Jen had a point too, I whispered. Whoever or whatever is up there is bound to check down here eventually. You want to be down here when that happens? I'll take my fucking chances. Ned had found an ice axe and heaps of junk and held it with a white-knuckled grip. I realized that my loudmouthed childhood friend was even more frightened than Zoe and I. To my surprise, Zoe's cold hand slid into mine. You ready? I nodded. Come on, Ned, come with us. There won't be another chance. No way! I'm staying right here! Ned shook his head. The last I saw was his pale, stunned face, watching us scramble out into the winter sun. Zoe and I charged through the snow, afraid to look back. Afraid of what might be following. We kept our eyes away from the red patches in the snow where Jennifer had met her end, aiming instead for a suspicious trail of footprints that led from the woods up to Deathrich Lodge. One large human three dogs. Ghosts don't leave footprints, do they? Zoe murmured. I shook my head, wondering where this insane day would lead us. Zoe and I barely entered the silence of the pine forest when we heard the gunshot. The boom of a shotgun blast. Ned had been found. Zoe grabbed my arm. I could feel her warmth through our improvised blanket coats. It was what I'd dreamed of when I'd planned this vacation, alone with Zoe, holding her close in winter woods. But my dream had turned into a nightmare. The triumphant bang of the dogs and a man's manic laughter carried to us by the winds, confirming what we'd already feared. My friend was dead. And for a long minute we held each other, listening to our thundering heartbeats. A reminder that we were still alive. But for how long? The footprints in the snow seemed to follow a sort of game trail, just like the ones Lee said the death riches had used. A small creek ran along it. My feet were exhausted from slogging through the high snow, but we had put more distance between us and pursuit. Right around the time I lost sensation in my feet, we rounded a corner and saw a slumped-over hut just up ahead. The footprints we'd been following seemed to originate from there. I swallowed hard and looked back at the boulder-strewn mountainside behind us. Hold up. Hide up there. I told Zoe. I'll see if it's safe. I'll come with you. There's no time to be a... She began. Listen, if it's not safe, we're both dead. This way at least one of us can make it. Are you sure? If we don't find warmth, food, and shelter, we're dead anyway. I gotta see what's in there. And if you... Zoe shut me up with a strong hug. Let me go instead. I want you to keep watch for me. I didn't like the idea at all, but I could see in Zoe's eyes that her mind was made up. She left me with an extra blanket and the other supplies that she'd dug out of the cellar. I set up a vantage point behind a boulder where I could see without being seen, or so I hoped. Now that the sun was setting and my sweat began to cool, I found myself rethinking what I'd said to Zoe. I'd intentionally exaggerated when I told her that we'd die without shelter, at least I thought so at the time, but as the pine tree shadows reached out for us like long fingers and temperatures dropped. I wasn't so sure. I wondered if covering ourselves with dirt would keep us warm enough, if I'd even be able to light a fire with my shaking hands. I fiddled nervously with the first thing I grabbed out of Zoe's blanket, the weird silver locket. I realized it had a clasp. It was probably one of those necklaces that held pictures inside. Down below, Zoe was a tiny black shape on the sagging steps of the hut. She pushed open the creaking door. I was so concerned about what might come out of it that I'd forgotten to pay attention to the path below. I suddenly sensed a presence just a few feet away. You alright, son? A voice muttered behind me, 
I nearly jumped out of my skin before I recognized it. Lee, I, I could have laughed for joy. If anyone knew a safe way off the mountain, it was him. We were attacked, I gasped. I, I know it sounds crazy, but I think Amos and his three dogs- Shh, Lee rasped. I seen him on my way down here, but I don't- Don't you worry, everything's gonna be alright now. No, the girl. Is she- You mean so? She's down there by the hut. Good. Lee whistled, and his voice changed. Sicker, boys! Three huge mastiffs bounded down the path towards the hut, barking loudly, and Lee stepped backwards. He held an ancient shotgun in his hands, and only then did I look down at the open heart-shaped locket I held in my hands. The black and white photo on the right showed a kindly-looking woman named Alice Deathrich, but the photo on the left was captioned Amos Deathrich, and the face it showed was a familiar one indeed. It was staring back at me from behind the barrel of a gun. Amos? I gasped. The dog circled the hut below, howling. Any minute now, they'd corner so. Now tell me you believe in ghosts. Thought you city folk were supposed to be smart. Try this on for size. Maybe Alice Deathrich survived the awful things those flashy out-of-towners did to her. Maybe she had a baby a few months later. A feral kid who raised himself after she died from her... Lingering injuries ten years later. Otherwise, who would have buried her for those trappers to find? And maybe later that kid grew up and decided he didn't want the family name to die with him. Maybe he kidnapped one of them high school girls that came up in the 1970s. He used her to get himself an heir. Maybe that heir, standing right here, right now, pointing all Amos's rifle in the face of yet another trespasser. I lifted my hand slowly. J just don't hurt Zoe. Hurt her. No, no, I need her. Gonna breed myself an heir the same way my father did and raise him to carry on the fight till this mountain's ours again. And after you go missing, even the tourism people won't be able to cover it up anymore. Lee Deathrich's speech was cut short by the half-rotten log that slammed into the side of his head. Zoe hit him two or three more times, but I... I doubt the blows were necessary. Lee Deathrich had met the fate of his ancestors, but I could hear his dogs baying below from inside the hut. You all right? Zoe asked. How did you? I wondered. That hut must be where he's been living. It was dim and filthy, but I saw a pile of rope around the time that I heard those dogs charging down the trail. I tied it to the front doorknob and left it just a crack. While I stood by the back door and waited for my moment. When those dogs charged in, I tugged the front door shut and slipped out the back. Deathrich's dogs are trapped in there, for, well, for now. I remembered how quickly the three mastiffs had gnawed their way through the lodge's kitchen door and shuddered. Would they even pursue us without Lee Deathrich urging them on? We didn't wait to find out. Night had fallen by the time we reached Deathrich's lodge. It felt like years had passed since we fled the cellar that morning. Too emotional and physically exhausted to talk much, Zoe and I distracted ourselves with simple tasks of survival, building a fire, heating water, gathering blankets... Reinforcing the doors in case the dogs or anything else came back. It had been the longest day of my life. And I ended it curled up with Zoe in front of the Deathrich Lodge fireplace. By morning the snow had melted and the unpaved switchbacking road to the Deathrich's mountain seemed just barely passable. Once we started driving, I realized just how much danger we were in. The back of my Corolla fishtailed on every turn, and twice the tires stuck in slushy mud and began to slide towards the cliffs beside us. When Zoe got out of the car to help me free it, I saw something that I still can't explain. I mean, maybe it was the stress, or... Maybe it was just a hallucination brought on by the stress. But... I swear... I swear I saw another Amos Deathrich. A look-alike watching us from the woods. Was the mountain really haunted? I mean, even worse, did Lee Deathrich have a brother? I mean, when I looked again, they were gone. I didn't have any answers then, and... I still don't. But I suggest... You stay away from Deathrich Lodge. Thank you. 
Since the James Webb Space Telescope launched, we've been seeing images unlike anything witnessed before. These snapshots of space are so clear, showing places so distant, that they reveal the beginnings of galaxies. Through this tool, we can see the past, and the hope is that one day we can observe the beginnings of our own universe. What that might look like could unlock mysteries and answer questions that we haven't yet imagined. But there's been another startling discovery which the general public has not been made aware of yet. We found something in space which scared the living hell out of me. And the worst part is, now that I've seen it, there's no going back. The images coming in from space were beautiful, and I was one of the first to have the opportunity to examine them. I was going over one image recently under intense magnification when I noticed something peculiar. It was a section of space which was unusually dark, lacking any light whatsoever, and some calculations showed that it was headed our way at an alarming rate. The cause of the light obstruction was within the Milky Way, and we had chalked it up to fine dust particles which absorbed light. Those would potentially account for the black blob floating towards Earth from the stars, which made no real sense. But when I examined the image more closely, I realized that I could see something in this new image. Something which our old Hubble telescope would have been unable to make out. I can't be, I muttered to myself in my home office, where I was looking at the picture. It was late at night, and the wind was howling outside as a storm raged on. It was raining, and occasionally claps of thunder were so loud it felt like the house shook with each blast. The power had flicked off and on once, and I was just waiting for it to happen again. There's no way. It has to be an artifact. I downloaded a new copy of the image, in case something had been corrupted during the file transfer. With such large images, it was always possible, though extremely unlikely. When I received the new image, I zoomed in on the section once again. I had saved the coordinates on the picture so I knew exactly where it was, and once again, there was the same distinctive shape. A dark blob swirling among the stars in our galaxy. But within it were familiar dark shapes resembling worms or millipedes. I picked up my cell phone, ignoring the time of night, and phoned another astronomer who had access to these preliminary images. They hadn't been released to the public yet, and they were classified. They were only available to a few of us. He picked up the phone, and I was worried that he would be annoyed with me calling so late, but he was up looking at the new images as well. Do me a favor, I said. Check out image 254, zoom in, close at x1.202, y5.200. Uh, tell me what you see. All right, he answered, zooming in on X1202, Y5.20, and, whoa, what is that, an, an artifact? I let out a deep exhale. I'm not crazy, you see them too. This can't be real. I wish it wasn't. The next day, the two of us set to work trying to figure out what exactly our theory was before we could try to prove it. This hypothesis could cost us our careers, even if we were right. Those things, what exactly are we looking at? David asked, leaning close to the giant computer monitor in my office. I let out a sigh. I was hoping he wouldn't make me say it out loud. They look like worms, I admitted. But you see that too, right? He nodded reluctantly, but didn't say anything. They'd have to be huge, you know, bigger than stars, bigger than solar systems. Nothing like that exists. At least nothing we know of. You remember Galactus, the planet eater? He asked. I tried to smile, but I couldn't. We need to get another image. Maybe more than just one, but first let's show Scott what we have here. Let's outline the shapes, try to present them as congenitally as we can. Our careers are on the line here. David didn't sound too enthusiastic. I knew he was a skeptic and would find a way to explain whatever this was, no matter what. Still, the two of us set to work, outlining the shapes in the darkness among the stars. He kept muttering that it was just an artifact. We were wasting our time. 
but I found that not only could I see dark worms, but legs underneath them. Many, many legs. Like enormous star-eating millipedes. <sighs> Shuddered at the thought, recalling the calculations which showed the dark blob was heading towards Earth at an alarming speed. Eventually, David went home, and I got the feeling he was starting to think I was crazy. But if I was wrong, then... Then what was the alternative explanation? He didn't seem to have an answer for that. That night, I went to sleep and had terrible nightmares. After staring at the computer screen all day, I, I imagined those dark millipedes squirming and wriggling their way out of my computer monitor, their fat bodies dropping onto my desk as they began to feast on our world, starting with my home office. Like termites, they began to eat my desk, starting with a wooden desktop, and then they quickly devoured the legs, moving onto my chair next. Their bodies grew fatter as they consumed everything in the room, revealing only darkness behind the facade of my furniture. And pretty soon it was impossible to distinguish the millipedes from the blackness all around me. I was floating in space, no stars. And the millipedes had run out of food. There was only one thing left to eat. Me. As they surrounded me on all sides, they began to crawl from the darkness onto my fingertips, onto my nose, and onto my eyelids, skittering across my skin with their innumerable legs, finding their way into any opening they could. And once they had eaten my eyes, I was left floating in darkness, cold, impenetrable darkness, which pressed in on me like a million tons of weight, compressing me as my body was consumed by a galaxy of worms. I woke up with a gasp, nearly screaming until I realized... An instant later, that it was all a dream. Not, not a dream. A horrible, surreal nightmare. The worst one I'd ever experienced in my life. It felt... too real. Scared to go back to sleep, I got out of bed and went to the kitchen to make coffee. The computer was sitting in the corner, dark and silent. I wandered over to it and turned it on, inhaling the smell of freshly brewed coffee while I waited for it to boot up. Once I was logged into the server, I pulled up that same image again. What the hell? My heart skipped a beat as I stared at the screen. The black blob in the image was bigger than before, almost, almost double. But it was the same picture that, that, that was impossible. I looked through the archive and checked to see if another image had been taken of the same quadrant, but there was nothing. The telescope had moved on to capture other images, redirecting its camera to observe a black hole in a completely different section of space. Zooming in on the image, I saw the black millipedes even more distinctly now. I picked up my cell phone and I called David immediately. He picked up, sounding groggy and annoyed. Who is this? Do you have any idea what time it is? He slurred. It's me. Hey, listen. You need to do something for me. Pull up that image again, the, the one of the worms. <sighs> Not this again. You really need to drop this, man. I'm trying to be nice here, but this is getting to be too much. David, I need you to listen to me. You need to look at it again. It, it's bigger. He had already hung up on me. I realized then that I was on my own. I have to present this information to the bosses myself. It'll be up to them to decide what to do with it. Unfortunately, David beat me to the punch. By the time I got to the office, he was already in with Scott, our boss. They were looking at the image together, and David was saying something quietly behind the desk to him when I came in. Ah, you're here, Scott said. David was just showing me what you found. And what do you think it is? The two of them eyed me up and down, making me feel small. You know, it's just an artifact, right? I mean, it's pretty clear. Don't you think they look like... like worms? Millipedes? Trust me, sir, I know how crazy this sounds. I'm not sure that you do. David said he tried to explain this to you, but you're not getting it. We can't have analysts on the team who can't tell the difference between the plausible and the impossible. Sir, what does that even mean? It means... It means you're fired. Your access with the JWST images has been revoked. From now on, you can see whatever we release to the public, just like everyone else. Sir, come on, please... I know how this sounds, but you have to believe me. I'm a rational person, but these worms, they're, they're getting bigger. I mean, just since yesterday, they're fatter, uh, larger. They're eating the fucking stars while we sit here. And we talk about whether they exist or not. 
See, this is what I'm talking about, David said. He didn't need to say it, though. I, I cringed at how deranged I sounded. I'm calling security. Leave your badge with them. Feel free to get the hell out of my office, Grimes. Scott said, looking back down at the screen again. And a few minutes later, I was out on the street. No job, no car. So that was a company lease. And pretty soon, I'd have nowhere to live either. Since nobody was likely to hire me after my dismissal. Especially given the reasons why I was let go. The field's a very small one. But word gets around fast. All I had left in my previous life was the image on my computer. The screenshot I had taken of a wormhole, as I had come to call it. When I pulled it up on my computer again, the dark spot at the center of the image was even more pronounced than before. I zoomed in on it using the highest level of magnification possible. And I let out a soft gasp of horror when I noticed something for the first time. I could actually see the worms moving now within the image. I could see them feasting on the glow which surrounded them, consuming the light from nearby stars, eating planets and entire galaxies with each swift snap of their jaws. I closed the image suddenly, my heart jackhammering in my chest. Suddenly, I wanted to get rid of the computer, to throw the whole thing in the dumpster outside. But I knew that I wouldn't be able to sleep if I did that. I knew it would only fester and boil inside of me if I couldn't see the progress of these universe-consuming worms. So that's what I've done. Every day I wake up and I look at the image. I stare in a horrified wonderment at what is coming for us all. I'm sure my boss must know by now. David as well. But they haven't reached out to apologize or say anything to me. Part of me wonders... I best not to think of those things. But still, part of me wonders if the worms can consume thoughts... If they're not limited in their ability to digest the universe, but can also consume things more metaphysical than stars. Can they eat our memories? Can they, can they make us blind to them? How else can I be the only one who sees them? And maybe the worms are laughing at me, knowing that only I can see them. They make others see what they want to see. All the while consuming the stars and growing larger and fatter, getting closer to us by the day. And I wish that was my biggest concern right now. I, I really do. If that were the case, I'd still have time. I'd have years, maybe decades. There's a bigger problem. I should have thrown out the computer. One day I pulled up the image and the worms had consumed all of it. They had reached the furthest margins of the massive image, feasting on every star and galaxy along the way. I tried to close it quickly. Seeing me squirming and wriggling their way across the borders of the image, but it was too late. The fat black millipedes made it across the screen onto my desktop, where the corners of the image met my computer monitor. They wriggled over and began to multiply immediately. The main image was closed, but I could still see the worms feasting on the edges of my desktop. They clambered over the side of the flat surface. My desktop background was a serene landscape of green rolling fields with a sunny blue sky dotted with clouds above, but now it looked infected with a swiftly spreading black plague that multiplied at each passing second. I screamed. I turned off the monitor as quickly as I could, hoping that that would get rid of them, hoping they'd be limited to existing inside the flickering screen, but instead, instead they persisted. And worse yet, I looked down to see one or two of them on the finger I used to push the power button. I tried to wash them off, but they were tenacious. They refused to leave my hand. They spread across my skin, and I could feel them. I could, I could feel them taking over. I could still use my phone with my other hand. I've been debating calling family or friends to tell them what I... Uh, I don't know, uh, but instead, I've chosen to spend my last remaining hours typing this, sharing this with all of you, because maybe... Maybe this is all my fault... Maybe I should have just left well enough alone. If I hadn't looked so closely into the darkness, I might not have seen what truly was lying within. But now that it's done, I need to be straight with you all. You need to know. You deserve to know. So you can make your peace with loved ones, with friends, family, and those that you've wronged. Only so much time remains. They're here. The worms that feast on light and leave only darkness in their wake, they're, they're here. And they're multiplying. 
quickly. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Kavi Pasta, and before we get started on tonight's story, I'm going to let you know about tonight's author, which you all know already. I'm almost certain you all know tonight's author. Jack Townsend is the author of Tales from the Gas Station, and Tales from the Gas Station's Volume 1 through 4, as well as Bedside Manor, are available now on Amazon. And before anyone asks in the comments, yes, I have gotten back to work on the audiobook for Volume 4 after my incredibly long time of health issues and life issues and everything like that, but I'm getting up. I'm catching up, I'm doing all that stuff, and it will be out soon, TM. And now, on to tonight's story. March 31st, 11.45pm. You may have already heard about the shitty gas station at the edge of town. It's garnered quite a bit of infamy over the past few years. But if you haven't yet been introduced, allow me to summarize. Weird things tend to happen there. Some of it can be explained away. Natural weather phenomenons, fumes from the local chemical plant, playing tricks on the mind. Bored townies burdened with too much time, alcohol, and drugs. Some other things, though, simply defy explanation. Perhaps the frequency of incidents has something to do with the fact that the business is always open. Barring a few incidents, where the building needed to close its doors for foundational repairs after the odd earthquake, sinkhole, or shootout. The business is otherwise operational 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and every day of the year. That includes holidays, yes, even the minor ones, even though, as one employee continuously argues, it sure would be nice to take a day off every April 1st. There's enough shenanigans to worry about without a whole day dedicated to the manufacturing of new ones. Not that it was ever expected to be effective, but there is a sign taped to the wall behind the cash register that very clearly states, no pranks allowed. It goes up every March 31st and stays up, usually, until someone removes it, steals it, or, in one case, sets it on fire. If you couldn't already guess, April Fool's Day is my least favorite holiday. If I didn't have a job to do, I'd be far away from the people, drowning my post-traumatic stress with something strong enough to kill the memories for at least another year. But duty calls, so here I am, sitting behind the cash register at the gas station and waiting to see what nonsense today has in store. At least I've got this journal to keep me occupied. April 1st, 12.20 a.m. Well, that didn't take long. Here it is, barely scratching the surface of our annual day of mischief, and things have already gone stupid. It started just before midnight, with a customer wandering the store, wearing an outfit made entirely of cardboard boxes and packing tape. To be honest, it was a decently impressive example of riddle and abuse ingenuity. Riddle ingenuity? The arms and legs were made from the long, skinny packages used to mail posters. The chest and feet were a bit more square, giving him a poor Voltron vibe. His helmet was pulled up on his head like a hat, not sure if it was just a courtesy to show his face or if the eye holes weren't big enough for him to see what he was shopping for. Or maybe he just really wanted to share his COVID with me. He was open mouth wet coughing all over the aisles, after all. Eventually, he found what he was looking for, a bottle of bleach, and brought it up to the counter. While I waited for his card to run, the man calmly opened the bottle and took a sip right in front of me. As I handed him his receipt, he squinted at my name tag and said, Thank you, Jack. Uh, can I ask you a question? I'd simply love it if you didn't, I responded. Would you, off the top of your head, know how much postage it would take to mail a package to the White House, like, say, 200 pounds, give or take? That'd be a question for somebody else. I was feeling less than inclined to be helpful, especially because, according to my watch, it was only 11.59 p.m., which meant this guy was not pulling an early April Fool's prank. He was just the normal, everyday kind of crazy. That's when the clock struck 12, and everything changed. The lights flickered off. The sound of dull chimes filled the room one after the other. The front door slammed open and a deep fog rolled in. The crazy box man sipped his bleach and stared out at the darkness until the chiming came to a stop. A dozen chimes in total. And then he walked into the store, dragging long chains behind him, arms stretched out as he moaned like a zombie that had just stubbed its toe. Damn it, Jerry, I yelled. We had a truce. No more April Fool's Day pranks. 
Who's this clown? Asked Boxman. That's Jerry, I explained. My roommate. It really says a lot when you're able to make the bleach-drinking madman raise an eyebrow and call you a clown. But if anyone can make such an impression, it's Jerry. Oh, he moaned as he shuffled towards us, stopping momentarily to pick up his chains and rattle them in the air. You're really coming to the bit this year, aren't you? At this point, Boxman excused himself and scooted out the door into the soupy cloud of fog. I am not the one they call Jerry. More chain rattling for emphasis. All right. Fine, I'll bite, I said. Who are you then? I am the great Hakshu, god of mischief. Hakshu? Gesundheit. Jerry, I said as I rubbed my eyes. You told me you couldn't work today because you tested positive for COVID, which means that you either lied in order to put together this elaborate ruse after I specifically asked you not to, or you were telling the truth and you just exposed me to your cooties. Either way, I'm pissed. Not Jerry Hakshu. A great Hakshu, he corrected, suddenly losing his spooky accent. Please don't forget my title. Go home, I said, before I kick your ass. A frown crept across his face. Who are you? He asked. I came for the one they call Jack. You are not him. I lost the thread here. What's the joke even supposed to be? Are you like a ghost or something? Where did that fog come from? Is that stuff safe to breathe? Where's Jack? He asked, dropping his chains and crossing his arms stubbornly. Are you serious right now? I asked. I mean, I honestly can't tell if you're joking or not. We've known each other for how many years? He shook his head. We've never met. Because you're not Jerry, right? You're the ghost Hakshu, god of mischief. That's correct. I decided it was time to play along. Okay, your majesty. If you are the god of mischief, then why do you look like my roommate? I am only allowed to speak to Jack. I am Jack, I shouted. Maybe a bit too loudly. Oh, really? He took a pair of glasses out of his front pants pocket and put them on his face. With a judgmental look, he let it along. Hmm. Then added after a pregnant pause. You don't look anything like I was expecting. Thought you'd be taller. Well, I am sitting down. Do you have any identification? That depends. Do you have a god of mischief warrant? I suddenly realized how silly it was to even try and defend myself. Now hang on a second. If you are the god of mischief, a god of mischief, not the god of mischief, little g. Oh, mischievous and humble? Not a common combination. Okay. So if you are a god of mischief, then why do you look like my roommate? I come to you in a form that you can more comfortably comprehend. This visage of a ghost is meant to remind you of your own pending mortality. But Jerry isn't dead. I mean... He had to be resuscitated one time after nearly drowning in a koi pond, but I don't know if that counts. I'll be perfectly honest with you, Jack. There weren't that many good options. We looked at all the possible dead people from your past, and apparently almost all of them tried to, like, kill you at some point. We spirits try not to take the form of someone that would send you running for the hills. So were you a spirit or a god? Don't overthink it. Okay. Let's say I believe you. Why are you visiting me? It's come to our attention that you do not understand the true importance of the season. You've lost your way. and need to be reminded why this holiday matters. How did it come to your attention? We saw it on your blog. He gestured at the laptop open on my counter. Believe it or not, most of the deities in the cosmic finite singularity are followers of your blog. Really? Yeah. We think that shit's hilarious. Thanks? He raised his hands dramatically. A bolt of lightning cracked loudly outside the building. Thunder reverberated around the room as he screamed in an inhuman voice, Enough philosophizing! At this point, much to my surprise, he began floating into the air, the chains around him hovering like tentacles behind his body, and his eyes turned pale white. Jack, hear my words! Okay. Tonight, you shall be visited by three spirits. Three spirits including you? What? No! Three additional spirits. Come on, think about it. I said shall be. If I were included, I would have said shall have been. That's... There's no way that's correct. Shut up! Okay, sorry. When the clock strikes one, another. When the clock strikes two, 
and a third at the stroke of three, I ventured. No, four, of course three. Electricity crackled from the tip of his fingers as he extended his left hand and pointed at my face. You have been warned. Now look to me no longer. I must wander. He glided through the air towards the open door, but then his hovering chains got caught on the sides of the frame. I waited as he finagled the ghostly appendages through the doorway one at a time, carefully but awkwardly, and when he finally got all the way through, he let out a victorious laugh and floated away to the foggy night. The door slammed shut, and that's when I began this journal entry. It's not out of the range of possibility for Jerry to have orchestrated such an elaborate plan, but, uh... You get a good feeling I'm in for some stranger things to come before the night is over. To be continued, I guess. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and before we get started on tonight's story, I want to tell you a quick thing about tonight's author. All of you know Jack Townsend, or you know Tales from the Gas Station at least, which is written by Jack Townsend. All Jack Townsend's books are available now on Amazon, and almost all of them are available in audiobook form, uh, narrated by yours truly, except for the fourth one that's currently being worked on as we speak. I'm also going to let you know about one thing you may not have known that's from Jack Townsend, and that's the Snake's Paw Podcast. The Snake's Paw Podcast features Jack as one of the voices, as well as every episode is written by Jack Townsend. It's a lot of fun. It's a hilarious romp between sci-fi, horror, and comedy in between. And very much worth your time if you enjoy hearing his stories here or on Amazon. Take a look at the links in the description down below to find his books as well as the Snake's Paw. And now, on to tonight's story. April 1st, 1.45 a.m. Holy crap, this is nuts. Okay, try and stay with me here. I've only got like 15 minutes before the next spirit shows up, and I really want to get this all down before it's too late. So, just like Jerry, uh, I mean, okay, the spirit, or God, or whatever it was, said, at one in the morning, I got a special visitor at the gas station. Now, this one didn't appear in a cloud of fog. There was no crack of lightning or flickering lights. On the hour, I heard the same noise, the mysterious chime, just once this time, one in the morning. It came in the form of an aura, a blindingly white light. If it was outside, you could probably notice it from orbit, but it was contained here in the gas station and it was coming entirely from the bathroom. I could only see the radiance of it poking out from the space between the door, but I could feel the brightness, like it was burning a piece of my soul. I'm sure if I looked directly at it, my eyes would have burned out of my sockets. I was only there for a few seconds, then I heard the toilet flush and the light was no more. When the door to the bathroom opened, I was not prepared for who I was about to see. The man, the spirit who emerged looked young. He was clean-shaven with red hair on top. He wore a tan overcoat on top of a black half-turtleneck. When he saw me, he smirked. Rick Astley? I asked, barely able to contain my surprise. No, he said. I'm the spirit of April Fool's past. Long past? No, your past. Assuming you are, he pulled the notepad out of his coat pocket and flipped it open to one of the pages. Jack. That, that's what the name tag says. Uh, may I be so bold as to inquire what business brings you here? Your welfare, Jack. I was afraid you were going to say that. The ginger spirit crossed the room, doing an unnecessary dance as he moved. He clapped his hands, shimmied, and then he was standing on the other side of the counter. He reached out to me and said, Rise, mortal. Walk with me. I'm, I'm actually good here. He put his hands on the counter and leaned in close, close enough that I could clearly hear him as he whispered. I am a spirit. I come from a realm beyond your comprehension. Do you really think I came all the way here to give you the option to say you're good here? He had a point. Okay, then, I said standing. How does this work? Take my hand. We're going on a little adventure to another time and place. We're going somewhere you've seen before, and we're going to find the moment you lost faith, the moment you abandoned the magic of the holiday season. I took his hand, and a spring-loaded buzzer hidden in the palm of his hand let out a mechanical whir as it simulated a low-voltage electric shock. Gotcha! He laughed. Not surprisingly, he was the only one laughing. I waited patiently for him to remove the gimmicky toy, and let him take my hand again. All right, now on to business. I want you to think back. Remember the moment you want to forget the most. 
Remember the worst April Fool's Day of your life. Well, this ought to be fun, I thought aloud. Right then, the gas station disappeared. The spirit and I were suspended in nothingness. The world, the universe, and even our bodies had ceased to be. And just as suddenly, it all came crashing back. Only now, we were someplace else. The walls were wood panels covered in posters and work orders tacked wherever space is allowed. The man in the corner sat behind a cheap plastic desk that looked like it had been picked up from the side of the road. He was a big guy sweating through his button-up shirt despite the box fan blowing air at his face from a couple feet away. It was much more humid in this place. The smell of cigarette smoke wasn't enough to cover the pungent odor of dead fish that filled the air. Flies buzzed past us as I looked at the spirit. He looked at me and smiled. What is this place? I asked. Do not worry, the spirit said. Nobody here can see you. You're but shadows. Shadows of what's been. Yeah, I get that, but I have no idea where we are. Does this not look familiar to you? The spirit said. His inflection made it seem like this was a rhetorical question, but the look in his eyes told me he was desperately hoping I would make the connection soon. Sorry. I said, I'm lost. The Rick Astley spirit retrieved his notepad, thumbed through the pages, and stared at something written there. He poked out his bottom lip and furrowed his brow. Is something wrong? I asked. His face shot up. What? Oh, uh, no, no, nothing's wrong. It's just... Are you sure you don't know this place? Why would I? So you're positive this isn't your foster home from when you were in the sixth grade? I laughed. Look around. Does this look like a foster home? I think this is some kind of business. I walked up to the wall and inspected the work orders that adorned it. Tiny yellow sheets of paper with information typed onto it in cryptic shorthand. Nothing any average person would understand except for the stamps on each that said either closed or open. Bus house, three job, two out, closed. VIP den, five job, five out, closed. Underground, VB, five job, all dead, open. I'm sorry, the spirit said. This is actually quite embarrassing, and all the years I've been doing this, I've never taken someone to the wrong past before. Here, uh, let's return and start over. The phone on the desk rang. We watched as the heavyset man answered it in a gruff voice. He said, Yeah? What the hell does he want? Okay, send him in. The spirit reached for me, but I pulled back. Wait, I said. I want to see where this is going. It's not a television show, Jack. This is someone's worst memory. It, it, it's way better than TV. Right then, the door opened. I instantly recognized the young man who entered. He wasn't in the sixth grade, but there was absolutely no denying that this was a younger me. What the fuck? I said. The look on the spirit's face, or I guess Rick Astley's face, told me that he was genuinely confused by this turn of events. The younger me appeared to be in his late teens, perhaps early twenties. He had short hair, camo pants, and a black long sleeve shirt. He must have been sweating his ass off in the weather, but he kept a professional look on his face and approached the man in the corner. Mr. Leachman, my name is... I know who you are! The heavy man leaned back in his chair and managed to look down his nose at the younger me while looking up at him. You're Tommy's kid brother. Yes, sir. Look, it's a damn shame what happened to him. They ever find the guy who hit his car? No, sir. Damn shame, I tell you. You know what? You ought to make it to where a hit and run is an instant death penalty. But you know those pussies in the government would never do something like that. No, that would make too much sense. I suppose so. The spirit and I closed in on these shadows from the past. Listen, the heavy guy continued. I could see new sweat forming on his face. I sent Tommy's last paycheck to his address. That's not why I'm here. But what is it then? Before the accident, Tommy... He told me he might be able to get me a job, and, well, with a funeral and everything, money's getting tight. I was wondering, I mean, I know I can't take on his role right away, but I'm a quick learner. I'm not afraid to work hard, get dirty, and the heavy man scooted his seat back, sc scraping it loudly against the floor. Hold on, he said. What exactly did Tommy tell you about this job? 
I know all about exterminating. Tommy showed me how to use the different poisons. Uh, I helped him fumigate our aunt's condo when she got fleas. I know how to... Listen, kid. The heavy man stood up. I ain't gonna bullshit you. This job requires a certain skill set, and you ain't got it. No, no, wait a second. Tommy said Tommy's dead, kid. It don't matter what he said. The younger me screamed. It mattered to me! Silence filled the room. A long, unnatural silence. The two men stood in place, unmoving, unblinking, unspeaking. It felt like the most intense stare-down in history, but then I noticed the black fly, swollen and fat, stuck in place in mid-air right in front of my face. It wasn't just the scream that brought the moment to a screeching halt. Nope. Time itself had literally stopped. Enough! The spirit screamed the word like it was poison he wanted out of his mouth. Cut the crap, Jack. How are you doing this? What is this place? I poked the suspended fly, but it remained frozen. Something told me that a Mack truck wouldn't have been able to pull it out of place. The force of time, of what was already written, was not something mortals could ever hope to overcome. I said the only thing that I could think of. I have no idea what's going on here, but I could tell you one thing. This never happened. Do you think I'm playing around here? Asked the spirit, dressed like the 80s musician turned meme, Rick Astley. I'll have you know, I take this job very seriously. I'm sure you do. He ran his hand through his voluminous red hair and took a deep breath. Then he circled the room twice, stopped, and smiled. I get it. This isn't your past at all. Well, yeah, Obs. No, in a sense it is. But this isn't your, your past. I don't follow? There is a terminus point in the finite curve of the gas station. He must have accidentally fallen through a gap. There is a remainder in a galactic equation that should have been rounded off. I've heard of this happening before, but the look on my face must have told him he needed to dumb it down just a bit further. Okay, this isn't the correct universe. We're in a version of your past that could have happened, but never did occur. You see, it might sound complicated to you, but no, I get it. Multiverses are all the rage in movies and television right now. I've already had it explained to me a thousand times. Yes, but have you ever had it explained in terms of updog? What's up, dog? Not much. What's up with you? The spirit laughed joyously, then snapped his fingers, bringing the whole scene back to life. The fly buzzed past my face. I watched as it landed in a web in the corner of the ceiling, where it promptly tangled itself up before being set upon by a shiny black spider. So we should probably go back home, right? I mean, considering this isn't even a real memory. The spirit held up a finger and said, hold on, hold on. I want to see where this is going. The door opened without a knock, and a tough-looking guy took a step into the room. As the younger me turned to face him, I registered the monumental realization on his face. He knew he messed up. He pushed too hard, and now he was about to get bounced. The guy looked like he was no stranger to busting heads. Scars on his hands and face, ears misshapen like he had a history of amateur boxing, hands on his sides and clenched in the fists, and a deep-set scowl that looked like it was the only face he was capable of making. It's okay, Bruno, the heavyset man said calmly. Our guest here was just about to leave. We got a problem, boss. Bruno's voice sounded like a bag of rocks. What does a bag of rocks sound like, you might ask? Well, Bruno's voice, of course, but I don't know how else to put it. You had to be there, okay? It was unsettling. Bruno took a step to the side. The younger man understood without being told. It was time for him, or me, to leave. He did so without another word. I went ahead and started to follow, but the spirit caught my arm. Hold up, he said. What are you doing? I asked. I sat through enough boring childhood memories that I know when something juicy is about to happen, and that's most certainly not going to be with the young man walking away. He's a B-story at best, but look at these two. They're like cartoons. So well realized. What's their deal? Who's Bruno? What do they do here? The younger me was already out the door. Bruno closed it behind him. Shouldn't we follow, you know, me? Don't be so selfish, the spirit said. After all these countless eons, I deserve to go off the rails just a little, don't I? As a treat. I didn't have time to answer before the heavy man began speaking. What's the problem? Bruno answered. He's here. Already? Plane must have landed early. He wants to start the job now. Shit. 
How many does he need? He's calling this a seven job. Guzman and Florida are on call. They can get here in ten minutes. What does that bring us to? Five. Six if I go too. He's not going to be happy if we can't provide him with the team he paid for. You think I don't know that? Shit. I got some mercs on their way out of East City, but they won't be here before day's end. You know, he isn't a patient man. What about him? Bruno pointed at the door with his thumb. Tommy's kid brother, I mean. With me and Guzman on the team, all we need are warm bodies to pad the numbers. Why not give the kid a shot? He doesn't know what we do here. Really? You mean Tommy never? You mean he thinks Tommy died in a car accident? Drops of sweat were dripping from the boss's face onto his desk. He closed his eyes and made a pained expression, like someone was crushing him from the inside. All right. With that word, he fell into his chair. Get the kid back in here. I'll call Guzman in Florida. What do you want me to tell him? Tell him only what he needs to know. The two of them froze in place. Once again, time had stopped. The spirit let out a laugh that morphed into the words, Ooh, this is exciting, isn't it? What do you think's happening? What are mercs? Do you think he meant mercenaries? I genuinely don't know where this is going. Uncertainty is such a beautiful thing, isn't it? Well, I'm glad that you're enjoying yourself, but I... I don't share your sense of curiosity or adventure, and I genuinely don't see why I have to be here for any of this. I mean, how about you stay, keep doing this, I'll go back to the gas station. That's not how this works, Jack. Your mind is powering this entire expedition. Come on, let's see what happens next. I didn't mean to grunt as audibly as I did, but the spirit didn't take offense. He just smiled, retrieved his notepad, and continued. I'll make a deal with you. The other option is we untangle this time knot and go visit your foster home that year your brother stole your pants and locked you outside for the day. Remember? The police got called. Why would you? I'll just write up a report saying we went to the correct memory. These visits to the past are mostly just a formality anyway. The only spirit journey that ever matters is the spirit of April Fools yet to come. I'm only here to familiarize you with the concept. So, what do you say? Get to go off page for a little longer? I threw up my hands. I mean... You're the supernatural entity here, so I'm just the schmuck who's along for the ride. That's the spirit, he said with a punch-inviting grin. Pun intended. He raised his hand, and with a snap of his fingers, we were gone from that place. The air was suddenly hotter, the lights dimmer. I shook my head until my bearings returned, slowly, lazily, and then I saw them. Bruno stood near a set of lockers. The younger me sat on a bench next to him. It was a small room, stuffy like we were underground. I know there's a lot to process, Bruno said. The younger me didn't seem phased. No, I always knew Tommy was into something. He had too much money for an exterminator. I just thought, you know, maybe it was drugs. Bruno opened a locker and began pulling out gear, tactical boots, Kevlar vest, ammo pouch. These were his, he said. They should fit close enough for one job. Impress the big guy, we'll bring you back for the next one. Who is he? Listen, kid. You gotta get those questions out of your system before you see him. This guy is the real deal, but if he catches a whiff that you're an amateur, he might call the job on the spot. What you do here tonight is simple. Keep quiet, follow my lead. I tell you to jump, jump. I tell you to shoot, shoot. I tell you to run. He pulled an automatic rifle from the locker next. The younger me took it without hesitation. Anything else I should know? Someone might try to test you. If anybody tells you that you remind them of someone they knew in the army, that's code to make sure you're on the same team. They tell you that, you respond, I need a drink. You got that? The younger me nodded. Ready? The voice almost made me jump. I forgot the spirit was still here with me. Ready for what? I asked. Well, this part feels like filler. Let's get to the action already, okay? He pointed at the door behind me. It's your show. He reached for the handle, and despite his early proclamation that these were merely shadows of things that once were, he succeeded in interacting with it. It turned. The door swung open. He stepped through, and I followed. Now on the other side, we were transported to a different time and place, neither very far from the previous time or place. We were outside now. Mosquitoes buzzed in the humid air as the sun set behind a cloudy horizon. 
There were six men lined up, standing at attention, near a black SUV. Bruno took one end, the younger me on the other. They were all armed to the teeth. The four in the middle stood tall, battle-worn, confident. Everything about them exaggerated the contrast from me, the runt on the end pretending he knew what he was in for. They weren't alone, though. There was another man with them. The big guy himself. He had dark skin and a thick black beard. A mountain of a man, full of muscle, exuding an air of sheer power. If it came down to a fair fight between him and the six men at attention, well, I sure wouldn't bet against him. When he spoke, the hairs on my neck bristled. All right, ladies. I see some new faces here, so I'm going to keep this quick. My name's Benjamin, and I'm not going to carry any of you. Tonight, we have a single target. Weaknesses are standard, which means bullets will do the trick. Stay off the comms unless there's a surprise. But there won't be any surprises. Any questions? Bruno was the only one who dared speak. What's the target look like? Unclear, but we ought to know it when we see it. At last report, it took the appearance of a human. Park ranger named Preston Creekbaum. 6'2", brown hair, medium build. But that was over 12 hours ago. So the target will not look like that anymore. Any more questions? There were none. At least, none spoken. Good. Load up. The screen froze in time. What the fuck is happening? The spirit asked. There was far less excitement in his voice this time around. This thread, it continues for a while. How is that possible? A pocket reality like this should have fallen apart after a few minutes, but the story goes on and on. I can see a long road out in front of us, but it shouldn't be possible. For an interdimensional cosmic spirit, he sure sounded rattled by the unknown. Kind of ironic, really, when you think about it. So, what now? I asked. The spirit checked its watch. We're actually running out of time. How, how, how could we possibly be running out of time? I only got an hour with you. I need to finish this up before the spirit of April Fool's present gets his turn. And that guy gets pissed when he has to wait. But that only raises further questions. Do you mind if we step on the gas a little bit in the story? I shrugged. He smiled. Good. Fast forward mode activated then. Do me a favor. Keep your eyes open for a hammer for. What's a hammer for? I asked. Driving nails. He laughed obnoxiously. With a snap of his fingers, we were transported to a clearing in the middle of a tangled forest. The mercs were gathered in a circle around a bloated corpse in a ranger's uniform. Hey, that's the guy, right? One of the men said. Stop! screamed Benjamin as he ran towards the group. Get away from it before... One of the eyes on the corpse exploded to the sound of a wet pop, and a long, pink, serpentine creature about the size of a garden snake leapt out of the body. It latched onto Bruno's face. He screamed and tried to grab the creature, but it was too fast. Bruno fell to his knees as the pink snake burrowed through his skull. Benjamin shoved one of the mercs out of the way, screaming, Stay back! Then unloaded a magazine of high-caliber rifle bullets into Bruno's dead body, tearing it to shreds. When the gun was empty and the shooting had stopped, the men looked at one another. One of them ignored the big guy's previous command and stepped over to the wet, meaty puddle of bones and viscera that had once been Bruno and said, Holy shit. What was this? The snake erupted from the gore with the sound of a loud screech. It hit the man, who stood too close, square in the neck, then disappeared under his skin. His face went ghost white, his blood spurted from the hole, but he didn't fall down. His eyes glazed over and he turned to face the others in short, stiff steps. Benjamin screamed as he loaded a new magazine into his gun. Shoot it! It's controlling him! It's... The man with a snake in his neck lifted his rifle and pointed it at the other men. Shadows of the past or not, I instinctively hit the ground before the next round of bullets began to fly. The sudden silence wasn't the most unnerving thing that had happened, but it was up there. When I opened my eyes, I could see bullets trapped in place in midair. Holy flippin' shit, said the spirit. This is not what I expected. He checked his watch again. We're almost done here, but I gotta see where this ends. He snapped his fingers. And we were gone. The muddy earth below me turned hard and cold. The air turned stale. It took me a second longer to realize that we were indoors. I rolled over and got to my feet. This is a small cabin, hardly more than a shed. Benjamin sat near the fireplace, a roaring blaze keeping the cramped room much too hot. He held a blade over the flames, the tip glowing red hot. There was only one other person from the time zone in the room, the younger me. He was covered in blood, but he was breathing. It didn't take a detective to figure out the rest of the crew wasn't as lucky. 
His shoulder wept a steady stream of blood onto the cabin floor until Benjamin pressed the heated blade into place, cauterizing the wound to the sound of a blood-curdling scream. "'Good work today, kid,' Benjamin said, handing over a flask. The younger me took and drank freely. "'Sorry about your crew.' Eventually, the younger me managed to get out the words, "'It's okay.' The big guy pulled two cigars from his jacket, leaned over and lit them in the fire. He put the first between his teeth, then handed the other to the wounded kid on the floor. The younger me didn't hesitate to take the celebratory smoke. The thing is, Benjamin said, pausing to take a puff, this didn't turn out the way any of us expected. Men died who didn't need to. It wasn't anyone's fault, really. It was the creature's fault. The younger me dropped his cigar and flask, then began to violently cough. His face turned bright red as the coughing became shallower and shallower. He struggled to breathe, fighting the constriction in his neck, but it was no use. He struggled in silence, desperate for air for one more breath, but none would come. Yeah, it was a creature's fault. But I told your boss. I told him what I needed. I needed a six-man crew. I needed six pros. But he only gave me five. I saw Bruno watching you. His head wasn't in the game because he was babysitting when he should have been paying attention. Now I ain't saying that's the reason they're all dead. I just want you to understand that's why I can't let you walk out of this one. His words didn't matter. The younger man on the floor couldn't hear him anymore. Benjamin picked up the flask and made sure the top was on, then stuffed it into his pocket. Sorry, kid. But it is what it is. Wait wait a second, the spirit said loudly. So, you died? What the hell? Benjamin pulled a cellular phone from his pocket. I took a step closer, close enough to see the number he dialed, but it was just a saved contact number, HQ. Benjamin, he said into the receiver. Password Echo Alpha. He froze with his mouth still open, tongue in his teeth, staring straight ahead. Well, this has been interesting, to say the least. I was getting so tired of this spirit. At least I didn't have to deal with him very, very much longer. But it's time for us to get back to your shitty real life. This boring gas station attendant, shall we? He snapped his fingers. But this time, nothing happened. The world didn't vanish. We stayed put. Exactly like I wanted. What's wrong? I asked in my most innocent voice. Nothing, he lied. Sometimes it takes a couple snaps for it to work, he lied again. He snapped, and the world stayed as it was. It could snap again and again, but as long as I had my wave disruptor on, nothing would change. I removed the device from my pocket. The spirit looked at it and laughed. <laughs> nice camera phone, he said, but I'm afraid you can't take any pictures here. These memories are only in your mind. They don't show up on film and can't be recorded. I adjusted the settings on the disruptor to only cancel out the S-wave frequencies, to the spirit, it probably looked like I was texting. He continued to smile at me nervously until I executed the new routine, causing the memory to resume from right where we left off. Tango 9792 Victor. The spirit jumped as Benjamin resumed talking. The big guy stood and started for the door. Status report. Target's been neutralized. Local team was compromised. Witnesses terminated. Request immediate evac. He stepped into the cold night air and slammed the door shut behind him so hard, dust fell from the ceiling. This is unnatural, but not unheard of, the spirit assured me. I have everything under control. No, I said. I don't think you do. Right then, I woke up gasping for air. Uh, not me that was standing, talking to the spirit, the me on the ground. I gagged and fought and strained against the poison constricting my muscles. I fought hard against whatever the hell that asshole Benjamin had put in that flask. A morsel of air broke through the floodgates, and that was when I knew I wasn't about to die. I tried to scream, but it wasn't time for that yet. My heart pounded and my lungs begged. Every part of me wanted nothing more than to stay alive. It was nothing but luck and sheer force of will that saved me that day, as I struggled against death long enough to take another breath. And then another. The spirit said aloud, Holy fuck, you survived! Of course I survived, I said. How else would I have been alive for us to meet? The spirit shook his head like he thought I wasn't getting it. But this didn't happen. This is an alternate timeline. One where you never worked at the gas station, but instead became a monster hunter or, or something. It's not like... 
This time, when the words froze mid-sentence, it wasn't from any kind of magic or parascience. It was because I rolled up my sleeve to show the spirit how wrong he was. The gears turned quickly once he saw the old scar on my shoulder, the burn from when Benjamin cauterized my wound all those years ago. The spirit couldn't have known exactly what was happening, but he was smart enough to try and run. He went for the cabin door. I stayed close behind him. We passed through together and into another scene from my memory. It was only four years later, but I had gone from a younger man to a world-weary soldier. I was sitting in the recruitment office of the initiative. The commander stood behind the egghead scientists. They listened to my entire story without judgment, the reason for my medical discharge, and they told me something I never heard before. They believed me, and they wanted to help me. The spirit hooked the right and went to the closest door. If this was really the Institute, it would have led to a balcony overseeing the compound's hundred-acre grounds, but it wasn't. Instead, it took us to another memory, a classroom. Only two people in this memory. My commander pointed at the picture on the projection that took up the entire wall. It was a photo of a young man sitting behind a cash register. Jack Townsend, my commander said. You'll find his dossier to be an interesting read. You need to study him, imitate, do what he does, live how he lives, think how he thinks. The spirits must believe that you are him. The spirit spun on his heels. There were no other exits in this room. I had him cornered. It was time to go on the offensive. Finally, I wrapped my fingers into the silver-plated knuckles and delivered a clean haymaker across the temple. If the spirit had been human, he would have put him in a coma at the least. Thank God the nerds were right. Silver was enough to put him down. He moaned up at me from the floor, telling me that he wouldn't be a problem anymore. Good, I thought to myself. I have a lot more work left to do tonight. I reset the disruptor and the program settings. Next stop, April Fool's Day. One year ago, I grabbed the spirit by his leg and dragged him back through the doorway. We were transported to the Special Species Containment Unit in the sub-basement of the Liskov Institute. There were two other people in this negatively charged Faraday cage built by non-magnetic titanium and silver. They couldn't see us, but they knew we were here. My commander looked at me from one year ago, then nodded. The old me programmed the disruptor with our exact coordinates. I'd been studying the tech for the greater part of the last decade, and was immediately familiarized with all the settings. Now, my commander said, explain this to me again. In one year's time, the old me elaborated, I'll return to this point in the timeline and drop off the anomaly. It will remain trapped inside these walls for exactly one year. After the temporal energy is worn off, we'll open the cage. He's powerless to escape. The spirit sat up. What? No, you, you can't leave me here for an entire year. I'll go mad with boredom. Sorry, I lied. Wait, he shouted, tears in his eyes. At, at least let me have a, a henway before you go. What's a henway? I asked. He laughed maniacally and answered, About three pounds. I pressed the button on my device and transferred me back to the original timeline. Anyway, sorry. I know that was a slog to read, but part of my job infiltrating this place was acting just like Jack. And for some reason, Jack writes down every single thing that happens to him in this stupid laptop. I had to keep up appearances, didn't I? Oh, I just heard that weird chime again. Twice this time. Two already. I guess that means I gotta go. Like I said, this is nuts. April 1st, 2 10 a.m. I'm just gonna go ahead and say it. That was fun. Not every day a decade long plan to apprehend multi dimensional anomalies pans out so successfully. In fact, it was such a success, I don't even need to continue writing. I'm done. So why do I continue? Well, I suppose it's my victory lap. Or maybe I spent so much time trying to get inside of Jack's head that I felt a certain sense of duty to finish his blog entry. Don't worry, by the way. If you actually liked that guy for some reason, he's still alive. He just is tied up and gagged in the storage room, which is a lot more than I can say for the spirit of April Fool's Day present. She appeared right on time wearing a dress made out of red and yellow flowers. She didn't drive with the same grand entrance as her predecessor, and... If it weren't for the fact that her head was actually that of a white deer skull, complete with an empty eye socket and missing lower jaw, I would have categorized her entrance as being perfectly ordinary. <laughs> I don't know how she talked with that setup, but she managed just fine. I let her go through the same movements as the other anomalies. The whole, you don't look like I was expecting, was starting to get really old, but whatever. 
She eventually got to the point, took my hand, and told me that we were going on a journey to see the ones I cared about most on this April Fool's Day. She thought that meant we'd arrived at Jack's home, where his sick roommate was adorning the home with birthday decorations and burning a candle. Yeah, I read the whole file. But instead, we went to exactly where the ones I cared about the most, my brother-in-arms at the Institute, were waiting. We arrived inside the containment field in the sub-basement of the Institute. The spirit didn't even get another word out before the shackles went into place. As the guards took her away for processing and testing, I approached my commander. He smiled at me and asked, Did you get what you were after? Benjamin's passcode, Echo Alpha Tango 9792 Victor. Excellent work. Together we approached the Faraday cage. I scanned my fingerprints on the monitor, opening the cage for the first time in one year. We found him slumped in the corner, muttering to himself over and over. Never gonna give you up, etc., etc. All right, boys and girls, that's about the last you'll ever hear from me. If we never see each other again, it'll be too soon. And remember, watch your back. Never trust anyone. Signed, Special Agent Brick Roscoe, Liskov Institute for Societal Advancement. April 1st, 2.58 a.m. Hey guys, it's Jack again. The real Jack, I mean. Yeah, I just finished reading all the crap the other guy wrote. I hope none of you fell for it. His attempts at imitating me are... Embarrassing, to say the least? I mean, voice like a bag of rocks? What does that even mean? I digress. Mr. Roscoe jumped me last night, stumped me into the closet with nothing to keep myself occupied except a bunch of audiobooks. I'm not entirely upset that I missed the spirits, but... I'd be lying if I said the agent's account didn't make me feel sorry for the poor ghosts. Oh shit, that means I gotta explain to the next one why their friends are MIA. Crap. This really is the stupidest day of the entire year, isn't it? God, I wish I could have stayed home. Oh, great. Just heard three chimes. Wish me luck. April 1st, 3.30 a.m. They were actually pretty cool about it, <laughs> but I had to fill out some paperwork, an incident report or something, and then they gave me a voucher for two free spirit journeys in the future, which I am... Almost positive I won't use. The spirit of April Fool's yet to come did show me the future, though, and it was exactly what I expected. Death, destruction, wanton violence, polar ice caps melting, all the puppies dying. Uh, Brandon Fraser getting his Oscar revoked. You know, uh, the worst of the worst. And it's all somehow going to be my fault. So I asked the spirit, who, by the way, looked nothing like the Grim Reaper. No, it actually looked like the form of a little girl in a sundress carrying a six-foot scythe. If these images were the shadows of things that will be, or if they were the shadows of things that only may be. The spirit actually gave me an answer, though. The future is not set in stone. It can be avoided, but doing so will require either a lot of luck or a lot of snoo. I learned long ago that luck wasn't something I could ever count on, but I was a little confused by her statement. What's snoo? I asked. Oh, not much. What's new with you? Anyway, happy April Fool's Day, y'all. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta. And before we get started on tonight's story, I'm going to let you know about tonight's sponsor, Freedom's Twilight. Freedom's Twilight is a game that's just launched on Steam. And I'm going to be playing the trailer for you right now. Summoned to a strange dark fantasy world of a miss, you will encounter both natural and supernatural obstacles as you explore, collect, craft, learn, build, and survive the fog that's blanketed the realm. Fight back the abhorrent creatures of darkness and build yourself a place that you can call home. I've been talking to the developer for this game for a little bit. It looks incredibly fun. Uh, what he's told me is there's almost 400 hours just in the initial launch of gameplay. So if you guys like pretty dark fantasy stories, incredible settings, and some pretty good action gameplay, then I strongly suggest you check out the game. You can find it in the link in the description down below. And now, on to tonight's story. My newly engraved nameplate wasn't the only surprise I received that Monday morning. While Casimir was recovering at home from our incident with Harry, my partner would be everyone's favorite hitman turned used car salesman, Victor Bonicelli. Vic was waiting on the sidelines while everyone congratulated me for earning my name, looking like an unusually husky medieval warrior in his chainmail and Kevlar bodysuit. When the crowd thinned out, he clomped over in his brand new leather boots and gave me a hearty slap on the back. 
I stumbled forward a bit and let out a soft oof sound. Vic beamed at me and hollered, Good on you, Billy boy. Seriously did a great job in there, kid. Most guys wouldn't have the balls to hug a Sasquatch. They're not Billy fucking white bread, are they? <laughs> I knew I did right by hiring you. Had a feeling you were a good kid. Real stand-up guy. I motioned at his outfit and asked, You filling in for Kaz? Yeah, I got no choice, Vic sighed. Can't just go down on a temp agency, get yourself a new caretaker, that's for sure. Go suit up, kid. Not the suit you were using for the undead, the other one. I'm gonna be working in the aviary wing. Don't forget the bird seat. I gave him an incredulous look and asked, Are you being serious? Because it would be a nice change of pace if I didn't have to fear for my life today. Nah, I'm just fucking with you. Vic grinned. These things don't eat no bird seed. They eat meat. More importantly, they'll eat you if you're not careful. No joke. Now hurry up, put on your chain mail, Billy. You got work to do. The service tunnel was a bit different than what I'd seen in the other two wings. On the other side of the security door, there was a flight of concrete stairs that descended a good 20 feet below the ground floor of the building. The aviary exhibits were partially underground so the creatures could have more room to fly around. As we walked down the steep flight of stairs, Vic told me there was only two cryptids currently residing in the aviary wing. He had a thunderbird, and as his words, just a mid-sized forest dragon, not one of them big bastards from the mountains. To be clear, I wasn't very stoked about having Vic as my partner. He was cheerful and personable. He was also a homicidal maniac. In fact, he was best known in certain circles for his expertise in the art of sawing apart corpses for easier disposal. Vic would bear me in the woods if he ever suspected my secret plan for a zoo. He'd shoot me dead where I stood and not even blink. With this in mind, Victor Bonicelli was also known to be very good at peering into a person's heart and seeing their true intentions. Salvatore had told me, Vic's a fucking bloodhound. And I believed him. When Vic looked you in the eye, you could almost feel his gaze piercing into your brain. All in all, I was pretty fucking nervous to be in close proximity to him day in and day out for the next couple of weeks or so. I smiled and nodded as Vic prattled on about the dragon, and I silently wished Kaz a speedy recovery. A drink gun won't penetrate those scales, Vic was saying, so you gotta hit it in the underbelly. You paying attention? I don't like repeating myself. Yeah, uh, the underbelly, I repeated, and I pantomimed firing a rifle. Thankfully, I hadn't caught much of what he just said, but I heard enough to know the dragon was actually part worm, and its relatively thin wings weren't very good for flying. I wish I could get my hands on a mountain dragon, Vic grumbled. I'll tell you, those babies are something else. Can't be done, though. I don't think it's possible to trap one. It's housing the thing that's the problem. I need to build a Pyrex domes four feet thick, 200 feet high. And crunch the numbers. is not doable. I'm not. So I'm stuck with this feisty little fucker here. We were standing in front of a typical exhibit entrance, replete with pneumatic locking bolts and sturdy porthole windows. I peered through the glass and saw a woodland scene that was reminiscent of Harry's habitat, but not quite as dim or densely forested. There was a lizard-like creature laying in the clearing in the center of the room, basking in the morning sunshine. It looked a bit like a crocodile, and a bit like an anaconda. It's just a pinch of bat thrown in for good measure. I breathed. Oh, that's really fucking cool. Is it intelligent? I mean, aren't, aren't dragons supposed to be, like, wise or, or something? Vic snorted. <clears throat> nah, forest dragons are pretty dumb. And worms, shit, ain't even dumber. It's a hybrid, so it's a bit smarter than your average worm, but it's a bit stupider than your typical forest dragon. It can sort of understand what you're saying most of the time, but it, it can't talk back. Can't read or write, nothing like that. It's a temperamental bastard, too. Anyway, uh, like, like I was saying earlier, after grabbing a cattle prod out of the supply room before you go in, the dragon might start flapping around a bit to intimidate you. Don't pay it no mind, it can't fly good. Not good enough to lift you up in the air. If it gets too close, get us that. You know, show it who's boss. 
Vic looked at me patiently for a few seconds, waiting for me to go do something. I looked back at him with growing confusion. Finally, Vic let out an irritated grunt and said, <laughs> What are you on strike or something? We get the fucking cattle prod, dummy. Yeah, that's right, in the supply room over there. Jesus, Mary, Joseph. Am I talking to myself over here? I protested. The way you worded it made it sound like nobody had to go in there just yet. Jeez, man. You really... Vic held a finger to his lips and pointed at the supply room across the hall with the other hand. I promptly shut up and scurried over to fetch a cattle prod. Vic called out, hey, Grab two! One for each of us! I came back with a disturbed expression and a cattle prod in each hand. I asked, Why is there a walk-in freezer full of dead goats in there? Vic shook his head at me and muttered, What are you thinking Dragon eats, genius? Think they eat hamburgers and hot dogs? No, they feed them goats, chickens. Maybe a deer now and then for some variety. That we don't feed any life, Pracy, because that could be dangerous. If forest dragons don't got no magic, they uh, can't breathe fire. They don't hoard any treasure. They can't grant you a wish, nah, none of that shit. They're just overgrown lizards that can fly around a bit. But Donnie, Donnie catches a hoof in the mouth. That could be a serious injury. It's a safer bet, just chuck him in there already dead. I said, okay, sure. I mean, that makes sense. This was a lie. Literally nothing about the zoo made any sense. Not one bit. I wasn't about to say that to Vic. I steeled myself for yet another encounter with the unknown and asked, So, what do I need to do in here? Mostly you just gotta pick up the bones and then piles of shit, Vic said casually. It's a biological creature just like the goblin. He eats shits, cycle of life. The Sasquatch buries his shit and the rest of them just crap on the ground, leave it there. It's the reality of being a zookeeper, I guess. What you gonna do? Donnie the dragon, I murmured in a bemused tone. Why do you keep referring to Donnie as an it? Vic chuckled ruefully and said, Well, I actually thought all forest dragons were boys, whatever, but as it turns out, I was incorrect. They produce asexually, as in once every hundred years or so, they lay and fertilize their own eggs. It's crazy, right? <laughs> I've been told it's probably an evolutionary trait, because these dragons, geez, they can't freaking stand each other. They won't tolerate any other dragons in their territory. They see another dragon. It's probably going to be a fight to the death. Nature's pretty hardcore, I agreed. Okay, so I go in, I pick up the bones and poop. Uh, does it need a frozen goat today, or... Nah, Esmeralda dumped one in there a few days ago. Donnie usually lets the goat get a bit right before it chows down. The nature in the proteins of some decay makes it easier to chew. That's... That, that's gross as fuck, I grumbled to myself. And I stared blankly at the keypad beside the door. I was too distracted by my unease with Vic's presence to remember the code. He squeezed my shoulder and asked, but didn't you see the memo? Got changed to 5395 this week. Trying to tighten up security measures and all that. Anywho, we keep a shovel with some garbage bags right near the door. Get scooping, Billy boy, don't worry. I'll be watching out here like a hawk. Old Vic's got your back. I muttered, thanks, Vic. And I entered the habitat. It smelled like a combination of cool, dank forest and big, stinky lizard. Donnie the dragon appeared to be having a snooze. This suited me just fine. Now that I was on the other side of the door, Donnie looked a hell of a lot bigger. He was curled up, nose to tail, a lump of a reptilian muscle the size of a buffalo. He was covered by an interlocking shield of triangular scales, each one of them ending in a savage-looking point. Donnie's tail was ten feet long and thicker than a telephone pole at its base, tapering down to four or five inches of rib-shattering devastation near the tip. It ended in a spiky protrusion that was clearly designed to pulverize bone and crack open skulls. I give the industrial strength cattle prod in my hand a skeptical look and clipped it onto my utility belt. The dragon gave me a sleepy glance and closed its eyes again. It seemed completely unconcerned with my presence. I started tiptoeing around with my garbage bag and shovel, quietly playing treasure hunt from piles of dragon shit. There were also the scattered remains of past meals lying here and there on the earthy floor of the habitat, and they stank to high heaven. I was struggling not to gag. 
After about 20 minutes, I was finished scouring the habitat. I had collected three garbage bags worth of dragon refuse, and I was more than ready to leave. The dragon had quietly napped in the sunlight for the duration of my visit, basking its exposed belly without a care in the world. It seemed my very first encounter with a dragon was going pretty well, all in all. I was pretty surprised. As I was dragging the putrid garbage bags over to the exit, Vic turned on the intercom and said, Hey kid, get your cattle prod ready, Donnie's giving you a look. I looked over and sure enough, the dragon was now awake and it was giving me a cold, considering stare. It heaved itself up onto its feet, let out an enormous, jaw-cracking yawn, then started ambling towards me with its tail swishing back and forth through the air. I dropped the bags and scrambled for the cattle prod on my belt. I held it up and called out, Take it easy, Donnie! I'm already on my way out! The dragon frowned at the cattle prod and said, I'm not going to eat you. Stop embarrassing yourself. I did a double take and called out, Hey, Vic, did you hear that? Hear what? His voice crackled over the speaker. Come on, quit fucking around and get out of there. He can't hear me, Donnie said. I'm speaking to you in your mind. Please don't make a scene. I sputtered. How, how come Vic doesn't know about this? Donnie settled back on his haunches and let out another yawn. He doesn't know because I never told him. Look, we don't have much time, so be quiet and listen. I know what you're planning to do, and I'm on your side. When the time comes, release me from this prison, and I'll help you bring it all down. I stared at the dragon in shock. I let out a shaky breath and whispered, How do you know about any of that? I never, I've never even seen you before. Oh, I know all kinds of things, Donnie assured me. Be careful to keep your plans a secret. Victor isn't a clever man, but he has the gift of insight. He can look into a man's heart and see his true intentions. Keep a lid on it until you're ready to act, or he'll kill you. Vic turned on the intercom and hollered, What's going on in there, kid? You have a conversation in there? Trust me, this ugly fuck don't understand a single word you're saying. All I can do is eat and shit. Now, come on, let's go. The dragon murmured. Well, the time is right, come for me. Be very careful, Billy Whitebread. You live in dangerous times. I exited the habitat wearing my best poker face. Vic threw up his hands in exasperation and said, Don't get it riled up, Billy. Well, you might regret it. Overgrown gecko has a bite like a hydraulic press. You know, I, I seen it eat. There's a big crunch and half a goat's lying there on the ground. Chews it up, bones and all. It's fucking horrifying to watch. Sorry, Vic. I apologized. And I avoided looking him in the eye. I was trying to make friends with it. You know, saying stuff like, oh, you're such a good dragon, that kind of thing. Yeah, hey, don't wait your breath, Vic grunted. Not a dog. It's a big fucking lizard. They don't care about you, right? <laughs> Come on, let's go check on that Thunderbird. I asked him, isn't a Thunderbird supposed to be like a demigod or something like that? Nah, it's a bunch of horse shit. They're just birds. I mean, they're really big friggin' birds, and they can kill you, but they're just birds. I swear, people are always saying to me, a Thunderbird's a god or something, right? And I'm like, if it's a god, why the hell is it locked up in my zoo? <laughs> I swear, so much misinformation going on around here, Billy. I can only shake my head, you know what I mean? <laughs> people, people believe anything. I burst out into a long, shaky fit of giggles. He frowned at me and said, What's so funny? What did I say? I just shook my head and blurted, Let's go, Vic. I want to see this big freaking bird. Bird's a word, he grinned. We both started to laugh. Vic was laughing because he was a darkly jovial kind of guy. And I was laughing to prevent myself from screaming. All I wanted to do was jump in a car and get onto the highway and speed off into the sunset. Truth be told, I kind of wasn't holding up so great anymore. The pressure of all the constant weirdness was starting to take its toll. The thrill of this completely insane and top-secret life was wearing thin. I wanted to get off this wild ride and return to my normal, boring little existence. But there was no feasible way to go back. 
I was doomed to see this situation play out until the end. I went to bed exhausted and I fell asleep immediately. At some point during the small hours of the morning, something compelled me to open my eyes and I let out a startled squawk of terror. There was a circle of eight sprites faintly glowing in the impenetrable darkness above my head. They were hovering in the air and studying me with blank expressions on their tiny faces. I tried my damnedest to jump up and run for my life, but I, I was stuck. The weight of their collective will had me pinned to the bed. I was helpless. Finally, one of them turned to the others and said, I disagree. It's not intelligent. And one shook his head and warbled, Nay, the poor thing's not stupid. It's only ignorant. I believe it thinks and feels as we do. There was a burst of high-pitched and virtually incomprehensible dialogue between the eight sprites, which ended with the first sprite yelling, Silence! I am the king. I have the final word in all deeds and matters. Human, speak on thine own behalf, and be judged accordingly. Art thou pure of heart? I sputtered, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, yes, sure I am, P pure as gold. The sprites all whirled together like eight spinning tops, all of them making their high-pitched, unearthly trilling sounds as they did so. When they finished with the twirling and trilling, the king of the sprites floated down until he was hovering just a few inches away from my face. He jabbed the tip of my nose with a tiny finger and growled, I have revealed myself this eve with the gravest of doubts in my heart. I do not believe you are worthy of my assistance. Dost thou plead thy never-ending fealty to I, Mercus Honeydew, King of the Sprites, thine fealty or thine head? Which wouldst thou pledge unto me? Uh, fealty? I squeaked in terror. De definitely fealty. The king's tidy lips twitched in a brief smile. He drifted ever closer and murmured, Follow the thread, mortal, and take heed. Can you see? You must be where the one who walks in the moonlight. The light is close to thine heart. Thine heart, the others chanted in unison as they all engaged in another manic twirl to emphasize their point. I stammered, what thread? I can't see anything. God, I'm so lost over here. It's not even funny. The king floated up to the others and threw his head up in frustration. Do you still believe it is intelligent? He demanded. We have shown it the way, yet it still cannot see. Why should I care about the fate of this creature? It is no difference to me than a dung beetle or a pine cone. The other sprites buzzed their wings and trilled amongst themselves for a few moments. They all nodded in agreement, and one of them drifted closer to King Mercus. It performed a humble bowing gesture and then said, Intelligence cannot be quantified by only one set of measures, my lord. It may be a simple creature, but it is clearly capable of reason and it is pure. And what of it? The king demanded. Self-awareness means bugger all. This lowly lump is hardly more than dirt and clay. Why should we interfere with its fate? Because it wishes to release the prisoners, the other sprite answered quietly. Without our assistance, it will surely fail. I croaked. How does everyone know that? It was violently shushed by all eight of my tiny intruders. King Marcus sighed. Very well. He floated down to stand on my chest. He pulled out a sword that must have been all of two inches long, and he lightly tapped me on either side of my nose. Mercus cleared his throat and called out, Hear ye, hear ye. In return for thine fealty to the king of the sprites, and thou shalt be granted our assistance. Go forth into the world and walk without fear, puny mortal. For thou art shielded from all manner of evil in the order of I, Marcus Honeydew, king of the sprites. Marcus sheathed his sword with a flourish. It favored me with a benevolent smile. His hands planted on his hips in a stately fashion. I stared back at him awkwardly for a few seconds, then I murmured, Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually not going to leave because, you know, I, <clears throat> I, I live here. Maybe you guys... Marcus clapped his hands to his forehead and exclaimed, Oh, right, of course. My apologies. The king floated back up to join his subjects in the air above my bed. He called down to me, Rest easy, mortal. Be you a fool or a wise man. You have my protection. The sprites twirled together as one and shot upward in a blur of movement. They passed through the ceiling like it wasn't even there. And then, 
they were gone. I was left feeling like a boneless puddle by the magical force the sprites had used to hold me still. I urgently needed to take a piss, but getting out of bed was a tall order for someone with no bones. It took me several tries before I could sit up and heave my legs over the side. I held myself up with a towel rod as I did my business, and then I lurched back to bed. I wondered if Len was out there on the street watching me, listening from behind the wheel of his car and deciding it didn't matter anymore. I was under the protection of his majesty, Marcus Honeydew, king of the flying Barbie dolls. I had a cigarette in the dark, watching the smoke drift towards the open window in the moonlight. My nerves were screaming, but my body was exhausted. I dropped the button to an empty Coke can, curled up into a defensive ball, and fell headfirst into the abyss. I woke up once again with the feeling that I wasn't alone. I opened my eyes to a disorienting wash of morning sunlight. There was a large figure standing in front of the window. I squinted against the light, still half asleep, and I saw it was... Vic. He rumbled. That was good to you, kid. Is this how you repay me? I fell out of bed in a tangle of blankets. My mind was a thunderstorm of terror and panic. I held out my hands in supplication and gasped. I didn't do anything, boss. I swear I didn't do anything. Vic stared at me with a grim expression, slowly shaking his head. Then his lips curled into a grin. He snorted out a strangled laugh and yelled, Come here, you're killing me over here. It's a joke, Billy. Don't shit yourself. You should have seen your face, though. Are you sure you didn't? You got some to hide? I don't know. That look was pretty convincing. I moaned, Stop it. Oh, stop it. Okay, just stop. I can't believe you. That's fucked up, Vic. That's just wrong. It was wrong. It was the wrong thing to do. Vic flapped a hand at me and said, Come on, don't be a little girl. You ain't dead, so you ain't got nothing to complain about. He ambled out the door and called over his shoulder. Go ahead, take a leak. Have a shower. All that morning stuff. Make it snappy. I'll be waiting for you in front in the car. I'll take you out for a nice breakfast, kiddo. You need to put some meat on those bones. I watched him leave with eyes like saucers. I was too close for comfort. Way too insanely motherfucking close. There was a horrible second or two where I was sure I was a dead man. I was so completely sure of it. I saw a gun in his hand that wasn't actually there. I couldn't stop shaking. Now he wanted to take me somewhere for breakfast. <sighs> what a guy. I found Vic out front sitting in an illegally parked Mercedes Benz sedan. He was smoking a cigar and listening to a news report in an ear splitting volume. I jumped into the passenger side and shouted, This is a great ride, Vic! Uh, could, could you turn that down a bit, please? Oh, sorry, kid. Yeah, you ready to start off the day, right? The breakfast's the most important meal. Doctors and whatnot, they always say that. Vic wheeled away from the curb with very little regard for oncoming motorists, and he gunned it down the street. I clutched the armrest as he weaved like a madman between slower moving traffic. He dialed in an oldie station and cranked it up to 11 alternately cursing other drivers and warbling off-key along to Richie Valens. Hey, good music! Vic bellowed as he turned it up even louder. Young kids, you don't got no good music these days. Sometimes I turn on that uh, the MTV and I'm like, the hell is this shit? I'll tell you, things were a lot better when guys like me were running the music industry. Yeah, those, those were the good old days, I yelled back. So where are we going? You're you're not taking me somewhere fancy, right? Vic hollered. Yeah, it's the fanciest joint in town. We're going to fucking McDonald's, kid. Do you think Victor Bonicelli eats grapes and caviar for breakfast? Hell no. I like to get two kinds of those egg hamburgers and a hash brown. Sometimes I get the hotcakes and sausage and I mix it up. <laughs> I told you already. I ain't no fancy pants over here. Only expensive thing I truly enjoy are whiskeys, cigars, and high-class broads. I never cheap out on one of those things. We pulled into the lineup at Mickey D's, and my stomach immediately started to growl. I'm not usually hungry first thing in the morning, but I don't, I don't have fast food vapors. But I don't have fast food vapors wafting in my nostrils. I'm not usually hungry first thing in the morning, but I don't have fast food vapors wafting in my nostrils either. True to his word, Vic got himself two of those egg hamburgers and a hash brown. I followed his lead and we both got a large coffee. 
Vic parked the Mercedes across three parking spots, and we dug into our breakfast as Eddie Kutrin sang about teen angst and the summertime blues. I turned to Vic and said, You know, this is a great idea. Uh, thanks for breakfast, boss. Vic beamed at me with crumbs and flecks of eggs on his lips. Hey, don't mention it, kid. We gotta fatten you up a little, you know, you, you skin and bones over there. Maybe I'll take you over to the deli later this week. You can get a pastrami on rye, meet some of the... hey yo. Who's this I see? Is that, uh... Vic was staring at a heavy-set middle-aged man in a pair of blue coveralls. He was approaching a white cargo van with a drink in one hand and his keys in the other. Vic narrowed his eyes, and his smile collapsed into a snarl. He popped open his door and said, Wait here, kid. Give me a minute. He hustled over to intercept the other man as he was unlocking his van. The man looked over his shoulder as Vic approached, and his broad, ruddy face went pale as milk. Vic snarled, Did you have a good breakfast, cocksucker? Eddie closed the last few steps between them, had a dead run. The target of Vic's wrath dropped his drink and raised his hands over his face. He had time to shriek, Victor, no! Then Victor blasted a punch through his flailing arms, hitting him in the mouth with brutal force. The guy bounced off the door of the van and fell to the ground. Vic proceeded to relentlessly kick him as he curled up into the fetal position, grunting in pain as Vic's Adidas running shoes thudded into his legs and kidneys. Vic panted, The money, you fat fuck! And he stomped on the helpless man's ankles, making him screech in agony. He tried to worm his way under the van, but Vic grabbed his legs and dragged him back. Vic seized the man by the hair and forced him to look up. He balled his free hand into a fist and he proceeded to emphasize his words with a series of shots to the face. Where's the money, you deadbeat prick, huh? Mario Gabali says he ain't seen your sorry ass for three weeks. If Mario don't get his money, I don't get my money, capiche? You wanna fucking stand me, you degenerate asshole? Vic's last punch broke the guy's nose, releasing a heavy gush of blood over his swollen lips. Vic let go of his hair and growled, No more fucking around, douchebag. Get a hold of Mario. It works something out. Don't make me come looking for you. The victim collapsed in a heap. And Victor lumbered back to the Mercedes with a vague look of disgust on his face. At least a dozen people were staring at him in open mouth shock, but no one dared to say anything. I should know, because I was one of them. My only coherent thought as Vic climbed behind the wheel was... Holy fucking shit. Yes, taking care of some business, Vic wheezed as he wiped a few smears of blood off of his knuckles with a McDonald's napkin. He was breathing hard, still winded from kicking another human being into multiple ruptures. He had a strange, muddy look in his eyes like he had just awoken from a dream. It scared me. Let's get going, Billy. <laughs> we don't want to be late, do we? I muttered, yeah, yeah, let's go and dropped the remains of my second Egg McMuffin in the bag. I no longer had an appetite. I took a quick peek at the victim as we were driving away. Several people were drifting over to help him, but he shook his head and motioned for them to go away. He had tried to stand up, but his foot was dangling uselessly from his broken ankle. The poor bastard was completely fucked from head to toe. He needed an ambulance. By the time we got to the zoo, the darkness in Vic's eyes had vanished like a passing thunderstorm. He was all smiles, singing along with the radio and making random observations about the state of the world. The incident was a somber reminder that despite his outwardly cheerful demeanor, Vic was a very bad man. I'd do well to always keep that fact in mind. It might mean the difference between life and death. The rest of the week passed without incident. Donnie the dragon kept silent and stuck to his dumb lizard act. I didn't wake up to the king of the sprites or murderous gangsters lurking in my room again, which was definitely appreciated. The only difficulty for the rest of the week was trying to convince the Thunderbird to not aggressively peck at me when I was cleaning his habitat. His name was Ross. He was a giant, 
grumpy asshole of a bird. Ross looked like a cross between a buzzard and an eagle, but he stood eight feet high and possessed a set of talons that could disembowel a cow with one swipe. Fortunately, Ross didn't possess any magical abilities, nor was he particularly intelligent. My uniform kept me safe from his claws, and the cattle prod was a good reminder to keep his distance. It quickly became evident that there would be no bonding with this foul-tempered animal, but at least he wasn't rocking my entire worldview with his explosive secrets. It was nice to deal with a creature with no hidden abilities or agendas, even if the damn thing kept trying to sneak up and bite me on the ass. When noon rolled around on Friday, Vic suggested we go visit a deli. Specifically, the deli he was talking about on Tuesday morning, right before what he referred to as the incident. Vic said, Come on, let's get a sandwich. He was shaking out there, Billy. You can meet some of the guys. I told them about you. They all want to meet you. I raised an eyebrow and asked, Who are you talking about when you say the guys, Vic? Vic rolled his eyes and said, You know, the guys. He pushed his lumpy nose over to one side for emphasis, then added, They're mostly uh, friends and associates, you know what I mean? Not exactly your average model citizens, mind you. They're all good fellas. They're like family to me. You catch my drift. Yeah, yeah, I, I get you. I answered in a listless tone. The very last thing I wanted was to meet more gangsters. I'd rather have a sleepover with the goblin, and I'm not even exaggerating. The monster in the habitat scared me, but gangsters like Vic? They were somehow much worse. The deli was close to the Little Italy district, which wasn't terribly surprising. A couple of tough-looking guys were sitting at a table on the sidewalk patio. One of them was eating a big, sloppy-looking sandwich. The other was gloomily smoking a cigarette. They both looked up as we approached, and the smoker asked, Hey, look who it is. Bonesaw Vic, live and in the flesh. How you doing, Victor? You look good. Vic beamed down at him and exclaimed, I'm feeling good too, you know what it is? <laughs> I stopped eating red meat on Wednesdays and Sundays. Only chicken and fish on those days. No exceptions. Haven't felt this good in years. The smoker buttered his cigarette in one plate and croaked, That's good, I have to remember that. Hey, thanks for taking care of that thing for me the other day. I appreciate it. Situation got resolved yesterday. Hey, no problem, Mario. Vic grinned. It's my pleasure. The other man put down his sandwich and asked, Who's your long-haired sidekick over here, Victor? He looks like he's about to play me a guitar solo, this guy. The three of them had a hearty laugh at my expense. Vic slapped me on the back and said, Mario, Tony, this is Billy. Billy is Mario Gimbali. That's Tony Andretto. Billy is the one I've been telling you about lately. He works for me. Tony waved a hand in the air and said, Wait a minute, are you talking about that dealership or the other thing? No, no, not the dealership, Vic snorted. He's too good for that shit. Oh, no. Billy's my up-and-coming star over at the other place. You know, even, even the Russian put in a good word for him. And that grumpy old fuck don't give a word. Say to nobody. Mario said, Well, pleasure to meet you, Billy. You probably already know this, but your boss over here is a huge prick. They all laughed again, and I joined in with a cautious smile. Vic ushered me through the glass door and into a dining area that was packed full of gangsters and their associates. Fifteen pairs of eyes swiveled in unison and locked onto my face, all of them gleaming with hostility and suspicion. Vic boomed, Good afternoon, fellas! We're shaking! Someone called out, I hear your gumar's been shaking! Her can's down at the teddy bar! And there was a raucous wave of laughter. Vic grinned and threw his hands in the air. I can't bring nobody decent around to meet you degenerates, can I? <laughs> Vic chuckled, Hey, what is Billy Whitebread? He works hard for me down at the thing. He needs a goddamn sandwich. Jackie, get this young fella pastrami on right, would you? The solo-faced old man behind the counter gave me a crisp nod and sprang into action. I looked around and saw Len sitting in a booth at the back of the room. Vinny the Pomp was crouched beside him, talking a mile a minute as he methodically devoured an enormous bagel. Len caught my eye and gave me a nod. He pointed at the empty bench seat across the table and called out, over here, kid. Bring the old man with you, I guess. Vic nudged my arm and handed me a plate that was heaped with a huge sandwich, a pickle, and a large pile of potato chips. He called back, I ain't no old man just yet, you big bald bastard. I leaned over and said in a low voice, See, we're all family. It's what it's all about, really. There's a big family having a few laughs, watching out for each other. Vic escorted me over to Len's booth. I sat down and Vic slid his bulk into the bench beside me, crowding me against the wall with his sheer girth. 
As big as he was, Len dwarfed him from across the booth. Vinny the Pomp looked like a curiously weathered child beside him. Len rumbled, Congrats, Billy. You earned your name, kid. I'm proud of you. How you doing today, boss man? Good, good, Vic crooned contently. Always good over here. Vinny is Billy White Bread Billy. This is Vincenzo Pompensino. Vinny the Pomp's best goddamn lawyer in the whole state, hands down. Vinny gave him a shocked look and exclaimed, What, only the state? I'm the best lawyer in the whole goddamn country, Victor, and I stand by that claim. Vinny looked over at me with a perfectly neutral expression of unfamiliarity and said, Pleased to meet you, Mr. Billy Whitebread. The pastrami sandwich in this place is better than a blowjob, I swear to God. Good choice, young man. I muttered, Pleased to meet you, and tried my best to appear casual. Vic gripped me by the shoulder and smiled at me fondly. He's a good kid, he said with pride. I ain't really choose him. So, what are you two fine gentlemen discussing just now? Just looked important? Me and the Pomp were just going over a few things, you know, about the thing we discussed a while ago. Vic nodded and said, Oh yeah, that thing. I remember that now. Making any headway over there? Then he shrugged and said, I think so. Uh, the thing is, with situations like this thing here, it can take a while for things to line up. Well, it ain't ever easy with a thing like that, Vic agreed. Hey, keep me post. Vic lowered his voice and asked, Hey, you guys heard yet? Somebody's stool pigeon disappearing. Everybody's losing their shit over it. And the fuzz are buzzing around, harassing everyone. Nobody knows what happened. Len, make sure you guys are aware of the situation. The DA's office is supposed to make the next move. Now their case is dead in the water, stuck on a can with their pants around their ankles, no toilet paper in sight. They're pissed right now. Hmm, that's too bad. Len said mildly, and they all burst into laughter. Len gave me an almost imperceptible look, that I twitched my finger on the table as a sign of acknowledgement. Vic still didn't know about the situation with Vince, and I needed it to stay that way if I wanted to continue drawing breath. We spent the rest of our extended lunchtime shooting the shit and having a laugh. I was introduced to a number of hardened criminals who came over to pay their respects to Victor, men with names like... Jimmy Hardball and Ronaldo the Noose. Around two o'clock, we said our goodbyes and went our separate ways. Vic drove us back to the zoo with a smile on his face. He clearly loved his gang of outlaws in his own selfish, narcissistic way. They were a family that he could control. Close friends who had no choice but to do his bidding. It was wholesome and completely twisted at the same time. He dropped me off beside my car and said, now why don't you go home for the day? Ain't much left to do. Truth be told, we need a few more displays in the aviary wing. I gotta get on the field crew to get out there. Find me some with wing. I asked. What's the field crew? Are they the ones who capture the exhibits in the wild? Victor groaned. Nah, I don't call it capturing, okay? Especially not around the guests. Sounds bad. I like to refer to it as, um, procuring. Sounds a lot nicer. Yeah, that's what they do. If you think the caretakers are a bunch of hard asses, you should meet the field crew. <laughs> They're a different breed, those people. I thanked him for lunch. I drove home with a full belly and a blank mind. I decided to take an afternoon nap and flicked on the TV for background noise. As I was starting to drift off, I was startled awake by a news update. Someone found a body in the trunk of an abandoned car. The victim was identified as Bobby the Bricklayer Antonio, the career criminal who had been known to be an associate of the Mafia. They briefly showed the dead man's picture on the screen, an old mugshot. I felt my heart freeze in my chest. I recognized his face immediately. It was the guy Vic had pummeled in the McDonald's parking lot. In my head, I heard Vic say, We're all family here, and I, um... I wondered about the nature of the so-called family that would kill each other so casually. I got up and I paced around the apartment for a while. I was restless, but I felt too paranoid to go out for a walk. Anyone could see me out there. They could follow me around, watch me without being detected. They could scoop me up and spirit me away and nobody would ever know what happened. There was a knock on the door and I answered it with my kitchen knife behind my back. 
To my surprise, my unexpected visitor was Len. Can I come in? He asked. I think we should talk. I pasted a surprised look on my face and exclaimed, Wow, this is new. You're asking to come in instead of just pie-facing me and forcing your way in? Len grimaced and then gently pushed me aside with his fingertips. He said, No need for the sarcasm, kid. I'm trying to be polite. I'm not very good at it. Look, just get the fuck out of the way. Let me in. We gotta talk. Len settled himself down on my couch and looked around approvingly. He said, That's much better. Keep it tidy, keep it clean. Makes life a lot easier, don't it? Reluctantly, I nodded my head and agreed. Len folded his arms in his lap and let out a deep breath. He said, Victor likes you. I think he has plans for you. He don't want you knocking around the zoo forever. He wants you out there, earning your keep. He sat down across from Len and said, What? You mean he wants me out there doing gangster stuff? I'm no tough guy, Len. I I think that's obvious. We got plenty of tough guys already. What we need is someone with brains and insight. That's you, kid. But here's the problem. I got a feeling you're up to something. I don't know what it is yet. But when I get a feeling like this, I'm usually right. I felt the blood drain from my face, and I started to vigorously deny any wrongdoing. Len held up his hand and snapped, Just can it for a second, Dumbo. Just listen to me, okay? If I'm getting this feeling about you, it won't be long before Vic does too. He's too happy with you right now to listen to his instincts. And that won't last forever. If he starts sending out feelers, he'll eventually find out about the thing with the hippie. Me, I'll be okay. I'm a made guy. Nobody's going to touch me without the go-ahead from the commission. And frankly, I did everyone a favor by getting rid of the snitch. You, however, it's a whole different situation. You ain't nobody important. You are drawing heat, and Vic likes to stay cool. If you get my drift. Don't matter if you didn't know about the snitching. You're involved. You know too much. Well, that isn't exactly new information, I grumbled. I'm painfully aware of that. Thank you very much. Don't be a smartass, Len rumbled. I'm trying to tell you point blank that I know you're cooking up some harebrained scheme. I don't know what it is yet, but I'm aware of it. You gotta understand something here, okay? If Vic puts your name on a piece of paper, I'm the one who's gonna take the job. Keeping an eye on you is my personal assignment, dickhead. That means I gotta keep you out of trouble. It also means I gotta take care of things if you become the trouble. You follow me, Billy? I like you. I really do. You might be a goofy little fuckhead, but I like you anyway. But if I get the call, I'll strangle you with a piece of piano wire and bury you in the woods. Full stop. I'll have to do it, kid. It's my job. The lad leaned forward with his massive hands laced together tightly and breathed. Don't make me do that to you, Billy. I don't need the blood of another innocent person on my hands. We stared at each other in silence for a few seconds. When I opened my mouth to speak, Len shushed me and stood up to leave. Don't say anything more about it, kid. Just forget whatever dumb shit scheme you got cooking upstairs. Go with the flow. Ask for a raise or something. Take some of that money you've earned. Have a wild night at a strip club. Ditch that shitty car. Get yourself some respectable wheels. You earned it. Len paused at the door and looked back with a grave expression on his broad, scarred-up face. He added, You gotta understand, kid. I'll kill you. I'd have no other choice. He walked out of my apartment without another word. I slowly closed the door behind him and put the kitchen knife back in the utensil drawer. It was dull as shit anyway. I needed to buy a new whetstone. Hell, why bother? I could just contact the guys who offered me a job selling steak knives and buy an entire set, replete with a chopping block and a lifetime guarantee. I had $4,000 sitting in my bank account and another two grand in a box under my bed. By my standards, I was rich as hell. 
and my newfound wealth came with a heavy cost of its own, didn't it? I was stuck between my own mortality, my fear of being murdered, and my desire to never be poor again for the rest of my life. Somewhere outside of this three-pointed dilemma, there was yet another factor. I genuinely liked most of the entities who populated this crazy, confusing new world I lived in. I liked the prisoners, but I also liked the people who ran the prison. More than that, I'd found a place where I belong, and that's almost as important as having enough money. Not quite, but definitely up there. Taking everything into consideration, I... I really did choose a terrible time to quit smoking pot. The cigarettes were just not cutting in. If I didn't find some kind of outlet for the bad feelings soon, I'd... I was gonna lose my shit and implode in a spectacular fashion. And that wouldn't help anyone, would it? I decided it was time I find myself a hobby. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I want to tell you thanks so much for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast if you happen to be listening to this as a podcast or as a YouTube or however else you managed to have found this story for tonight. And as always, I would love to give a big thank you to everyone who's supporting me over on Patreon. You guys are the real MVPs, you guys keep things going, especially while things have been nuts for me over the past couple of months. And things have been getting crazier and crazier as time goes on. You guys are the ones who are keeping me sane. And I mean that with all sincerity. That you guys have helped me immensely. <laughs> so, in my personal life and my professional life, I want to give a very big thank you to... Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Jacob Fensky, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, Lakeda Canizales, Mr. Green Foster, Pedal Squeezer, Gavis, Joseph Calarudo, Woody B, Dante Kincaid, Fox Hound 803, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Primark, Bastion Beefcake, Jeff Joyce Cultist, Love You Eminem, M, Insanity Gamer X, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Emma Clark, Jay Kearns, Himbo Jerry, Sam Ahai, Crusader Chocobo, Adam Arias, Captain Scurvy, Esther Bean, Raven Morris, Nate Cull, Our Min Sect Time, Angelus, Seclude, That Creepy Chick, Red Shadow Cat, Xavier and Cheyenne, Six Gay Rats in a Trench Coat, Turtle Man, Cryolinian, Lord Life's Best, Goring Tri Magazine, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Michael Inchok, Dirk Diver 030, Matt Bach, Voice of Sam, Chelly J, Michael, The Leader Count, Melted Lake, Holly Sue, William King, Sashi Sasaku, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Happy Birthday Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, 80's Nephew, Leadership, Acid System. Mog, Kiri the Sloth, Bester's Lampshade, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Paulson, and Corey Kenshin. To everyone on this list, everyone in the description, and of course anyone who could support even just one dollar, thank you all so much for making my life significantly easier with this. And if you guys would like to be able to join any of the names that you see here, or down there, or anything at all, head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. And with that, I wish you all a very, very pleasant night, and sweet dreams. <laughs>